Next, a hearing on the use of DNA technology by law enforcement agencies. The House subcommittee met today to hear about the availability and use of technology for processing such evidence. Federal and state law officials testified, including forensic specialists. It's three hours. A quorum being present, the Subcommittee on Government Efficiency, Financial Management, and Intergovernmental Relations will come to order. The subject of today's hearing, DNA technology, demonstrates the challenges that societies have confronted throughout history. Scientific advancements have, for the most part, improved the human condition. Yet these same advances have at times forced society to confront new challenges and perhaps new controls. Scientific advances, such as splitting the atom, for example, have led to the creation of the atomic bomb and nuclear power. Controls have been used. Some might even include the automobile on that list, and more controls have been used. The use of DNA technology is one of those issues. DNA technology is a powerful forensic tool for law enforcement. The technology was introduced into Great Britain by scientist A.J. Jeffries in 1985. Since the FBI introduced this technology to the United States in 1988, it has been used in thousands of cases to help convict the guilty and exonerate the innocent. This is possible because each person's DNA is unique and can be profiled through a laboratory test. When a crime has been committed, the criminal often leaves some form of DNA evidence at the crime scene. It may be a drop of blood, skin cells, saliva, or other body tissues. If a DNA profile obtained from such evidence is the same as a profile obtained from the suspect, it can be a strong indication that the suspect committed the crime. If the profiles are not the same, the suspect almost certainly did not commit the crime. In fact, according to the FBI, in about one of every four cases involving DNA, the initial suspect is exonerated. Recent DNA technology is more powerful and more sensitive than the original technology, and it is cheaper and quicker to test. Within a few days, a DNA profile can now be obtained from a blood stain the size of a pinhead. In one case, a burglar leaving the scene stopped in the kitchen for a snack on the way out. Forensic scientists obtained enough DNA from saliva left on the piece of cake that he had munched it on uh, to make a positive match. Another type of DNA can be extracted from the bones and strands of hair. The use of DNA evidence has become increasingly prevalent in part because federal, state, and local governments have worked together to develop and implement DNA analysis. The federal government has provided funding and guidelines through the DNA Identification Act of 1994 and subsequent legislation. The FBI has developed a coordinated set of local, state, and federal databases called the Combined DNA Index System, or CODIS. This system contains DNA profiles from convicted chemical uh, criminals, unresolved crimes, and missing persons. Every state now uses DNA evidence and requires that certain categories of criminals be profiled. Local police and prosecutors throughout the nation are increasingly well trained in how to use and how to obtain DNA evidence. Of course, DNA is much more than a forensic tool. It is also the basic chemical of inheritance. For that reason, as with other advances in technology, DNA evidence requires special cautions and safeguards. Although there are specific safeguards laid out in federal and state laws, issues of privacy are of concern to many. In addition, there are concerns about timeliness. The greater use of DNA technology has overwhelmed many, if not most, of the nation's forensic laboratories that analyze this evidence. The National Commission on the Future of DNA Evidence will testify before us that there are 750,000 collected but unanalyzed 
as aspects of DNA. And the federal and state governments have allocated funding specifically to reduce these backlogs. Still, the backlogs remain, allowing criminals to continue preying upon innocent victims and allowing those who have been wrongly convicted of a crime to languish in prison. When these samples are not processed in a timely manner, justice is delayed and in some cases denied due to varying statutes of limitations. Today, we want to learn how effectively the federal government is helping alleviate this backlog and how the federal assistance might be improved. Our first panel of witnesses will attest to the importance of timely DNA processing from their firsthand uh, experience. Is she here? Okay. Uh, in addition, there are uh, several uh, key witnesses from the beginning here, and Mr. Barry Sheck has been on the front line in defending the rights of those convicted of crimes to have access to post-conviction DNA testing. Following our first panel, we will hear from those who were involved in the analysis and collection of DNA evidence. They will discuss their successes and the challenges that lie in head. Uh, we welcome our witnesses. We look forward to their testimony. I'm now going to yield to the uh, gentlewoman from uh, New York. It was her idea to uh, have us take a look at this, and we're indebted to her and her staff who worked with our staff. And I'm delighted to have Ms. Maloney and opening statement. Uh, thank you, uh, Chairman Horn, for agreeing to have this hearing. Our ranking member, Jan Sharkowski, is on her way and will be here uh, shortly. I, I think that uh, DNA evidence is one of the most important crime-fighting technologies ever developed, and I am delighted that we will have the opportunity to examine this issue today. I would also like to thank all of our witnesses for taking time for their busy schedules to come here today. We are blessed to have a, a wealth of knowledge available, and I look uh, forward to hearing from each of you. I would especially like to mention two of my constituents who are here today, uh, Barry Sheck, the founder of the Innocence Project. Uh, under his leadership, 88 people have been exonerated, and he has worked uh, selflessly uh, to develop uh, policies and standards to bring more fairness and justice to the system. Another important leader is Keith Kenneth Coonrod, chair of the Consortium of Forensic Science Organizations. I thank you for all that you are doing and particularly for your strong work in New York. Today we will hear plenty about how powerful DNA technologies have become. We will, we will hear plenty about the magical powers of DNA, that DNA can be extracted from a drop of blood, that the chances of a solid DNA profile match being a coincidence can be one in a trillion. But I want to talk this morning about what this really means. DNA technology means that rapists and other violent offenders will not get away with their terrible crimes, even when there is absolutely nothing else to go on. A strand of hair, the bottom of a used stamp, or even DNA taken off of a victim's bruise can be used to catch and convict criminals. This means so much to so many victims of rape and violent crime all across this nation. <laughs> Just this last month in my district in New York City, police finally arrested a rapist who had assaulted a young NBC producer on her way home from work. Although police had been unable to locate her attacker for well over a year, DNA found on the victim following the attack turned out to match the DNA of a previously convicted burglary offender. With nothing else to go on, solid DNA evidence helped break the case. Without DNA, this criminal would still be on the streets. This is what this is all about, solving the crime, putting attackers and rapists behind bars. With that in mind, I have a few particular things that I would like to learn today, and I hope that our witnesses will be able to address them in their testimony or during the question and answer period. Last year, Congress passed the DNA Backlog Elimination Act, designed to help states and localities collect 
and process DNA samples taken from convicted offenders. I was proud that Congress passed that legislation. Expanding the DNA database means that more criminals will be caught when the DNA they leave at a crime scene is matched against the database. I, I would like to hear how this program is working. This was a critically important step, and I am, am eager to learn from our panel how much impact that legislation is having from your experience on the state and local level. But what I would also like to learn is how well evidence is being collected at the crime scene and from victims immediately following a crime. This is a forensic uh, <coughs> evidence collection kit. It contains all of the tools a professional needs to collect evidence from a rape victim. But many hospitals across the nation do not have these kits. In many places where kits are not available, forensic evidence is collected with nothing more than a cotton swab and a plastic bag. In many communities, professionals assigned the task of collecting evidence from rape victims have not been fully trained and opportunities to collect evidence are squandered. Also, when evidence is collected, many hospitals and communities lack the know-how of the resources to properly care for the forensic evidence they, they have already uh, collected. In the end, this means that even the most talented forensic scientist may have little to work with. No matter how big the database is, we can't fully recognize the benefits of the database without quality evidence. I am extremely interested in how we can ensure that evidence is collected and stored properly, and I hope that all of our witnesses will address these issues today. I, I thank all of our panel for coming, and I would also like to hear from you any ideas of where you think we should go in Congress, not only with the, uh, the data collection uh, backlog bill, what are the next steps that we can be taking to help uh, law enforcement officials and innocent officials in jail um, uh, benefit from this uh, scientific evidence in DNA. Thank you very much for coming. And our ranking chair woman is here, Jan Sharkowski. I uh, thank uh, the gentlewoman from New York. And we now uh, have the ranking member of this subcommittee, uh, uh, Ms. Sharkowski, and uh, the gentlewoman from uh, uh, Illinois. Uh, we look forward to your opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to thank you for holding this hearing, and I want to thank Ms. Maloney for her leadership on this issue and for requesting our subcommittee to review this important topic. Reviewing the use of new DNA technologies is an area that we can work together in a bipartisan fashion to ensure strong oversight. Democrats, Republicans, and independents recognize the need for increased safeguards when it comes to the use of an individual's genetic makeup. DNA can be a useful identifier in many situa situations, such as in solving crimes, determining paternity, and identifying human remains. Today, we'll hear from a number of experts regarding how DNA technologies are being used by law enforcement agencies. In criminal cases, DNA can link or exclude a suspect to a crime scene. Similarly, it can link or exclude a weapon, such as a knife, to a crime scene. DNA can be con con collected from blood, semen, skin, saliva, tissue, te tears, bone fragments, and other body fluids. DNA has even been collected from tears found on fragments of contact lenses. Una uh, usable DNA can now be extracted from very small samples, such as a drop of blood the size of a pinhead. In order for DNA to be helpful to law enforcement officers, it must be collected, stored, and accessible for retrieval. Whether at a crime scene, at a hospital, in prison, or in a laboratory, DNA must be collected properly. Law enforcement officers, hospital staff, and laboratory technicians must know how and what to collect and how to handle and transport it. They must ensure that the DNA samples are collected, the DNA samples are not contaminated, and the DNA samples from different persons are not mixed. Once the DNA is collected, it must be stored properly. Laboratories in only 35 states are adding DNA samples to the national database. We must push to have the other 15 states on board as soon as possible. In addition, within those 35 states that are participating, hundreds of thousands of samples have yet to be analyzed. We must also push to have this backlog reduced. 
I was a strong supporter of the DNA Backlog Elimination Act that passed last year, and I support ongoing efforts to appropriately fund DNA testing. Accessibility to the DNA samples once they are properly stored is also important. Unless every laboratory shares its samples with the national database, law enforcement officers in one state cannot review samples taken in another state. In addition, convicted felons should have an opportunity to have their DNA double-checked against the crime scene. As we will hear from some of our witnesses today, there are prisoners on death row who are fighting to get their DNA tested in order to prove their innocence. Last year, after noting that the state had freed more people than it had put to death, Illinois Governor George Ryan placed a moratorium on the death penalty. Ryan explained that a commission was needed to study 13 death penalty cases that were overturned after prisoners were found innocent due to factors like new DNA evidence, recanted testimony, or insufficient <coughs> evidence. Furthermore, I have co-sponsored H.R. 912, the Innocence Protection Act of 2001, which authorizes a person convicted of a federal crime to apply to the appropriate federal court for DNA testing to prove innocence and prohibits a state from denying an application for DNA testing made by a prisoner in state custody who is under sentence of death if specified conditions apply. Mr. Chairman, as DNA technologies continue to advance, we will need greater and greater coordination between our state, local, and federal law enforcement agencies. I am hoping this hearing will help us pave the way to such coordination. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, let me give you the procedure of the panel one, and then we'll do that to panel two again. On uh, panel one, we have two expert witnesses. Uh, Deborah Smith is the crime victim that uh, I mentioned earlier, and Barry Sheck is attorney, director of the Innocence Project of the Cardoza School of Law in New York. And uh, with uh, some members uh, have uh, statements, and we've read them all, and automatically, if you have submitted us a statement, uh, it goes into the uh, hearing record at this point, and then you can uh, s summarize it. Uh, we'd like you to uh, do it in about 10 minutes, because we've got a lot of witnesses here. But if you need to go beyond that, we will. And uh, we want to make sure your fine testimony we've seen throughout panels one and two, and want to make sure that uh, you can uh, have a discussion also with people that might not uh, agree with uh, some of the way processing is going on. And uh, we just want to get it all out on the record. This also is an investigative committee. We will be asking each of the witnesses uh, in a group uh, to uh, take the oath uh, that all the testimony uh, will be, uh, uh, I'll tell you right now, with the first panel. And do you solemnly, if you want to raise your uh, right arm, and uh, do you solemnly swear the testimony you're about to give, the subcommittee will be the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth? Yes. The clerk will note that both witnesses have affirmed the oath, and uh, we will now proceed Ms. Smith, we uh, appreciate uh, you coming with us because you are a, a crime victim and you know about these things more than anybody else would. So if you'd uh, like to begin with uh, your statement, we'd certainly appreciate having it. 03-03-89, dash 93-42-00 through 93-42-05, dash numbers of identification. 890-5010-C89-1968, human identification, 180907, 89-85-00-0234, written and spoken without a particular face impressed on the mind, 228-15-3839, 214515HA4, VA, 654195, cold, impersonal, but necessary numbers of human identification revealing personal information about this faceless 
individual. Never before had there been so many ways to identify me, and yet I had never felt so lost. I resented being referred to as a number. The numbers made it seem as if I didn't exist as a person, mechanical and unreal. Little did I know that it would be numbers, matching numbers, that would breathe air into my lungs and allow me to truly live again. There's no way for you to understand how what is done in the DNA laboratories can mean the difference between life and death without taking you back to March 3rd, 1989. It's around one o'clock on a Friday afternoon. Outside, it's cold and gray and there's a light mist falling. I'm in my home in a nice neighborhood in the city of Williamsburg, Virginia, which happens to be one of the safest cities in our country. My husband, who's a police lieutenant, was asleep upstairs after having been up over 30 hours. How could I have possibly been any safer? I had no way of knowing that within a matter of moments, my life and the lives of those around me would be changed forever. It was a typical day in the life of any wife and mother. I was cleaning house and doing laundry, preparing dessert for dinner with friends. In the midst of all this, I noticed that my dryer wasn't working properly, so I stepped outside to check the exhaust vent. When I returned, I decided to leave the back door unlocked, a door that is always locked. But I knew that I was going to return right away with the trash. But before I could return within moments, a stranger entered that door and nearly destroyed and definitely changed my life forever. This masked stranger forcibly took me out of my home into a wooded area where he blindfolded, robbed, and repeatedly raped me. This crime that took less than one hour has deprived me of the innocent outlook on life and on my freedom. The sound of his voice rang through my ears as a deafening clamor. Remember, I know where you live, and I will come back if you tell anyone. But I did tell someone. As soon as I was allowed to return home, I ran upstairs to where my husband was sleeping, and I woke him with the words, he got me, Rob, he got me. I begged him, please don't call the police. I pleaded with him not to tell anyone because I feared this man would keep his promise and he would return and kill me. But the police officer and my husband knew that we could not let this crime go unreported. He also convinced me of the importance of going to the hospital for he knew that we may need the evidence that would be collected from the rape kit. But all I wanted to do was to take a shower. I wanted to try to wash it all away. When we returned home from the hospital, I thought I could begin to process what had really happened. I had survived this terrible ordeal. I could put it behind me and go on. I didn't know that the worst was yet to come. My favorite place, my home, seemed now nothing more than cold stone and wood. Nothing seemed familiar. The one place I had always felt comfortable and safe was now taunting me with memories. I would relive this nightmare day after day, remembering more and more of the details each day as the shock began to wear off. It was far from being over. For the first time in my life, I couldn't find any reason to live. The love of my family and friends just wasn't enough because they couldn't erase the memories and they couldn't take away the pain. <clears throat> Even my faith in God seemed to be failing me, for there was no escaping the pain and no escaping the fear. Fear will not be satisfied until it has taken over your entire body and mind as a cancerous tumor. It cripples as arthritis making every movement unbearable until it's finally just no longer worth the pain. You become paralyzed, you feel trapped and helpless. It was always there, it was there in my waking hours as well as in my dreams, and on many occasions my husband would be awakened in the middle of the night to the sound of blood-curdling screams from my nightmares. <coughs> it was at this point that I began to realize that I could not and I absolutely would not live this way. Death seemed to be the only alternative, the only answer that would end this horrible nightmare that had become my life. In death, there would be peace and there would be quiet, for I would no longer have to hear his voice in my ears or feel his arms around my neck. And I would no longer have to see his face before my eyes. I knew that my mind could finally rest. I planned the suicide in my head over and over, but there was one problem that there seemed to be no solution for, and that was my husband and two children, because I worried who would find me. And would they have to live in guilt, feeling that they had somehow failed me? I wondered what this would do to them, and I thank God that it was my love for them was, that was stronger than my need to rid myself of my torment. I finally grabbed onto this thread, and it became my reason to live. One of the most frequent comments that I heard after I was raped was, at least you're alive. But I can tell you that still today, that while I was alive physically, inside I had died and I was, and I was 
completely dead. I cursed my attacker, in fact, for leaving me alive to live with the pain. This intruder never laid a physical hand on anyone in my family, but when he left, he left each one of us a victim. He touched emotions in us that we had never known. Suddenly, there was rage in the eyes of my young son. My daughter was afraid to go from the porch to the driveway after dark, and each one of us, especially my husband, felt the awful pain of guilt, for he felt as if he could protect the whole city of Williamsburg, but was unable to protect his own wife in our own home. Our home, which had always been filled with love and laughter, had now become just a house full of bitterness, anger, fear, and guilt. But my family and I were not the only victims that day. Every person that touched my life or my family's life was to feel the effect of this crime. They, too, felt invaded and vulnerable. I could see the pain in their eyes because I was a constant reminder that rape can happen to anyone, anywhere. They were angry for me, and yet they felt helpless, for there was nothing they could do. Our minds and our bodies ached for understanding, and yet there was none to be found. I waited daily to hear the news that they had found this man that had changed our lives so drastically. I lived in constant fear of his return, hearing his words over and over in my head. I know where you live, and I will come back, and I will kill you. The Williamsburg Police Department followed every lead and every clue, only to come up empty-handed. Even in my own mind, I began to doubt myself. I wondered if it really happened, was, or was it just some terrible nightmare? Do they believe me, or are they doubting my words just as I was doubting myself? But in my heart, I knew that it wasn't just some nightmare that was going to fade with time, but it would be one that I would have to live forever. I craved peace of mind, and I did everything I could to attain it. We put an alarm system in our home, including panic buttons throughout the house, as well as one that I could wear around my neck. The privacy fence was put up around our backyard and motion detectors installed. At one point, I even decided to carry a gun. There just didn't seem to be any way to attain this peace and rest that my mind and my body crave for so long. I would have to suffer daily with the memory of a man who was in my life for such a short span of time, and he may never have to pay for his crime, but I was going to have to pay for it forever. For six and a half years, I simply existed, trying to go on and live life as normal. I can tell you, that is only by the grace of God that I am still here today. VA 122015Y 01-14-91, just more numbers. 91-17682, But these numbers bring with them a life-giving force and renewed hope. 4183, 07-26-95. As George Lee sat at his computer in the Virginia Division of Forensic Science on July 24, 1995, on what probably seemed to him just a normal day at the lab, he had absolutely no way of knowing what effect his work that day would have on my life and those around me. On this day, Mr. Lee entered a prisoner's blood sample into the computer and it automatically began its cross-check against previously entered samples some of which were obtained from the rape kits. To his joy and surprise, he received a cold hit, something that was fairly rare in those de at that time. This information was passed on to the Williamsburg Police Department. They, in turn, passed the information on to the ship lieutenant working that day, who just happened to be my husband. On that day, July 26, 1995, my husband walked into our living room and handed me a composite that he'd carried with him ever since the incident and told me that I could throw it away because we weren't going to need it anymore. Not only had they identified my rapist, but he had been in prison for another crime and had been there since six months after I was attacked. For the first time in six and a half years, I could feel myself breathe. I felt validated. There was a real name and a real face to go with the nightmare that I had lived. And everyone would know that I was telling the truth that it was real. Finally, I could quit looking over my shoulder. No longer did I have to drive around in circles, hoping that a neighbor would drive by so that I could get the courage to get out of my car to go into our own home after dark if no one else was home. Unfamiliar noises no longer left me panic-stricken, and I no longer had to scan the faces in the crowd to see if maybe he was following me. And suicide was no longer a consideration. And finally, my husband is grateful that I don't wake him up as often in the middle of the night with the ear-piercing screams. Within myself, the healing had begun. 
and peace had come at last. Because of that rape kit, this man is off the streets for good. The jury gave Norman Jimerson two life sentences plus 25 years without parole. I stand here, or I sit here today before you as an example of the importance of the evidence obtained from the rape kit. Because of my husband insisting that I go to the hospital, I did not miss my children's college graduation, and I was present to watch my daughter walk down the aisle in November. And just this past Saturday, I watched as my son exchanged vows with his new bride. I am not a public speaker by nature, and it takes every ounce of courage that I can muster to be here. But I can tell you that I count it both a privilege and an honor to be allowed this small part of the furtherance of this cause. Any time a great tool such as this is available and not used, I think that our society commits a crime against its members. We must use the crime-solving capabilities of this powerful tool to its fullest, and I pray that all of you will consider its importance to me and thousands of other victims like me. Thank you. We thank you. Uh, it's a riveting uh, testimony, and uh, we thank you for taking the time to come here and share that experience, no matter how horrible it is. But uh, women all over America have uh, had just your experience, and uh, obviously you speak well for the thousands of women that have gone through this. And thank you for your uh, coming to share that with us. And uh, hopefully your testimony will get people to think more about these things and make sure that we get the type of DNA and everything else that can be dealt with to get these predators and put them away in prison forever. So thank you very much. Uh, would any of you have uh, questions uh, right now? Or we'll go to Mr. Sheck. Yeah. The gentlewoman from New York, Ms. Maloney. I, I uh, just on behalf of uh, women and girls all over the country, I'd say the world, uh, I want to thank you for your incredible testimony. It was very brave and, and uh, very important that you are here today. Your testimony uh, put uh, meaning behind the numbers. It put meaning behind the numbers to show the human aspect, and that's tremendously important. And I know that many of us will be even more inspired to, to develop every single tool we can uh, to further protect people. One of your statements um, was uh, very important, you said that every time a rape kit is available and not used, society commits a crime. And yet, I believe that these rape kits are not in every hospital, nor are they uniform. And I'm, I would like to ask you, do you think every hospital and medical center should have one of these rape kits? And do you think there should be a uniform rape kits that would help our police officers? solve the crimes absolutely because without the rape kit we would have never been able to um, have the evidence that we needed to convict um, Norman Jimerson because that was basically all we had was the evidence from that rape kit so and I would think that if we do it uniformly then it would become common knowledge of how to use it and exactly when the different labs get that then they would know exactly what they were looking at as opposed to, you know, a different kit from, from place to place. Thank you for your testimony. Uh, you. On your, uh, 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 the rape kit usage, do you, in your experience, was that done in a hospital with nurses or doctors or? Unfortunately, mine was done in the hospital with, um, with a doctor but um, our hospital has now changed that in that we have sane nurses in place, which I um, am very grateful, and that is a very, very important um, program to have in place in every single hospital. I'm thinking of paramedics also uh, and evidence, and uh, do you think uh, these rape kits should be in paramedics? Um, only if they're trained properly to use it because for a rape victim that is one of the first things that she has to go through and um, the when 
the first contacts that a rape victim has certainly has a great impact on how she's going to process what has just happened to her. And it can be a totally humiliating process to go through. And if it's done wrong, I would no doubt think that rape, uh, there's a, and I believe that that's why a lot of victims do not come forward now, is because we do not have the proper programs in place for that. So I would say that only a very trained paramedic should be, should be given that. And certainly the doctors in the hospital usually would be the, those on emergency duty. Uh, and um, who I think the staffs on both sides ought to take a look at some of these hospitals and are they educated on how to best utilize this because it's such a trauma that you're going through when you get rolled into that uh, uh, emergency ward. And um, I'd just like to know if ever in medical school they teach people about these things because uh, they're frightening. Uh, is the predator that went after you, uh, what's happened? Is He is, he is in jail uh, or in, in the Red Onion prison and um, he has been given two life sentences and plus 25 years with absolutely no chance of parole. He does have an appeal right now, but um, there doesn't look like there's any chance that anything will come of that. Mm. Well, it's good to know he's behind bars. That's for sure. Thank you. Yeah, the gentlewoman from Illinois. Thank you so much for your testimony, and I know it took a, a lot to do that, but hopefully it will result in having contributed a lot to changing it. But I wanted to, to ask you, you said that um, you all you wanted to do was take a shower and Wash. I don't know, not, not really forget about it, but yeah, wash it away. Um, and um, your husband convinced you that it was important. Um, I'm sure that that is the impulse of most rape victims. Wondering if, as painful as it might be, if we need to do a better job of convincing whoever might be in this horrible situation just how very important it is and how, if you have any suggestions, we might be able to communicate that at that terrible moment that the right choice is to go to the hospital and make sure that that DNA, that that evidence is collected. I think that, of course, education is, is the primary, um, would be the primary uh, factor in that. And uh, yes, I think that that is very important. And I think that that's one thing that the SANE program, which is sexual assault nurse examiners, do that. Because in the, um, um, in letting people know that that program is available, it lets people know that not only if you are sexually assaulted, that it's a one-on-one -on -one program where a nurse collects the evidence, that it also, if, if the rape victim herself does not hear that, then maybe her friend or whoever it is that she goes to will know that and that they can prompt her or take her or, you know, convince her to go and, and have this done. Um, and it, it is only education, and that is one reason why we decided to go public with this, is because rape is not something that, that the um, um, victim should feel guilty of, but yet it is the one crime that the blame is placed on the victim. And that's one reason that we decided to be public with this. And um, I, I believe that it's only as people will speak out and stand up and say, yes, I was, I have been raped, that it will make other victims um, able to go forth and go to the hospital and say, this did happen to me and I do want to, I want something done about this and, and take some of the fear and some of the guilt away from what's happened to her. I wanted to ask you a little bit about this, the, the sense of guilt and the fact that you said um, that you felt like now you were vindicated and that you were really believed. Was there reason for you, objective reason? I understand there were a lot of emotions going on, but were you made to feel that maybe it wasn't true? Were you interrogated in such a way that you, you felt that this really, they, that someone believed that it hadn't happened or? 
Um, not really. It was um, just basically something that we all, as victims, we all, you know, tend to second guess ourselves. But uh, one of the things that did make me feel that way was the questions that were asked to me. I was asked the same questions over and over again. They were just phrased a little differently. And I felt as if they were really not believing what I was saying. They were trying to you know, kind of trip me up to catch me in a lie is what I felt. And um, mind you, if I felt this way, other victims probably felt even more so because this did happen and uh, in my own community where my husband worked as a police officer. I was family, so they were handling me with kid gloves, so right. to speak. So I felt that if I felt this way, how much more must it be that way for other victims who don't have that contact? And that's when it really did become, that was also a, a very deep concern of mine because I know that I was handled very gently. And so it, it really did bother me of what other victims might be going through. So even though the subject of this hearing is DNA, I appreciate very much your, your sharing this and it can spill over into other issues that we can consider as a body. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, you mentioned the SANE program. What does that stand for? Sexual Assault Nurse Examiners. And they're trained um, by uh, a school out of our, our lab in Virginia. and. Um, it, they are trained to know how to do the physical collection of the evidence as well as handling those first emotional problems that a victim may have. Well, we thank you very much. Um, if you uh, uh, feel you've done your sufficient testimony here, uh, and if you want to stay, uh, we'd be delighted to have you uh, because the next panel will be on how the states and the federal government try to really get the DNA uh, data so that uh, people can be in, who should be in jail, ought to be in jail. So feel free to stay uh, the morning. Mr. Sheck, thank you. Uh, attorney, director of the Innocence Project of the Cardoza School of Law in New York. Uh, thank you very much. It's a privilege to be here. Let me start by saying this is the second time, I believe, that uh, uh, I've had the privilege to uh, be with Miss Debbie Smith and, and hear what she has to say. And, uh, I want to emphasize two points right away. I'm here to tell you about priorities on how we can most efficiently do DNA typing, uh, deal with these backlogs. Uh, and there are two initial points to be made that directly stem from what Debbie Smith told you today. Number one, every crime lab in this country the state and local level has to have the capacity to do DNA typing on a rape kit within seven to ten days after a crime like this is committed. So they can take the DNA profile of the assailant and put it in the data bank and see if it matches any other unsolved sexual assault that's going on in the community. Our laboratories do not have that capacity. I pick seven to ten days because that is the, uh, the turnaround time in the United Kingdom, where they are getting far more hits than we are linking unsolved cases to each other. That's number one. Number two, that's the second priority I mentioned in my testimony that's been submitted. There are hundreds of thousands of rape kits that are literally being thrown away in police labs, medical examiner's offices all across the United States. Our National DNA Commission had a survey done, a, frankly a quick and dirty survey, and I mean that no disrespect to the people that did it, uh, that estimated 180,000 untyped sexual assault kits, rape kits, throughout the country, but it is no doubt an underestimate. And literally what's happening is that these cases are not being typed. And they should be immediately typed and put in the system. So again, you will be able to identify serial rapists, serial rapist murderers right away. And yet, that is not happening. Uh, now, how do I come to be so concerned about that? <laughs> Aside from having heard uh, uh, Debbie Smith before <coughs> sitting as a commissioner of forensic uh, of the, on the National DNA Commission. Uh, 
what you may not know is that the, uh, my, I and the co-director of the Innocence Project, Peter Neufeld, actually serve as commissioners of forensic science in the state of New York. New York has a unique body called the Forensic Science Review Board. It's an independent group of professionals um, and crime lab people and judges and police officers that regulate our crime lab. We passed this bill six years ago. And so we officially regulate our crime labs and regulate the DNA data banks. And what I discovered wearing the hat as a commissioner of forensic science is that in the New York City Medical Examiner's Office alone, which just governs New York City, we had 25,000 untyped sexual assault kits, cases just like Debbie Smith's. And literally what would happen is that when the five-year statute of limitations would run, they would throw away the rape kits. And I went to the then police commissioner, uh, Howard Safer, uh, somebody that Peter Neufeld and I sue on a regular basis <laughs> in police brutality cases. And, With good uh, cause. <laughs> we sue him. We represent Abner Louima, and, uh, uh, who's a, a crime victim. So I said, listen, commissioner, you must stop this. And to his great credit, he said yes. Now, that was three years ago. And uh, he immediately put out for uh, uh, bid trying to outsource it to private labs because our state and local labs didn't have the capacity, an effort to type these 25,000 rape kits. And even in the most aggressive effort in the country to deal with this problem, we've only been able to type 8,000 to this point in time. All right. But one of them uh, is a, a very interesting case that I think has been noted by others, is that we had this terrible sexual assault uh, uh, that I think uh, uh, Congresswoman Maloney mentioned of a uh, producer uh, uh, that was uh, literally in the, in the middle of the day uh, dragged into a vestibule area at Rockefeller Center near uh, the NBC studios and sexually assaulted. Uh, the assailant in that case uh, we were able to get his DNA, even though he was out on parole or probation, uh, type it, put it into the data bank, and he was apprehended. And, and I'll explain why that matters. What I'd like to try to quickly go through with you are priorities. This is a subcommittee, part of a larger committee, that's talking about efficiency in government. We can throw a lot of money at this problem, and we should. We need, we are woefully underfunded on the state, local, and national level in terms of capacity to do DNA testing. But it is critically important that when we do this funding now, because we're never going to make up all the demand for this, we do it intelligently so that we can prevent uh, uh, crimes from being committed by apprehending the guilty assailants quicker. We can prevent innocent people from being arrested, tried, convicted, or God forbid executed, and there's more than enough evidence of that, um, in a very efficient way. And we need your help because some of the people that are about to testify before you, whom I've known well and worked with for years, are in bureaucracies. And they have their own uh, uh, problems dealing with all kinds of officials and all kinds of pressures put upon them. And I come before you, a law professor, right? Um, uh, a criminal defense lawyer, uh, somebody that uh, serves as a commissioner, a public official, and I must tell you that uh, I don't know anybody anything, <laughs> right? So I think I can speak uh, pretty directly to some of these priorities, and I, I ask you to query my friends carefully about them and see, if, uh, see why they can't uh, 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 better produce on these things. So number one priority, number one priority, you must have the capacity to type samples in rape cases and murder cases and, frankly, burglaries and other cases where you can do it right away within seven to ten days after the crime is committed. And what, what you must worry about is millions of dollars are being put into reducing backlogs is that you do not impair the capacities of the lab. Indeed, you have to get these labs to type the new cases right away because I've seen this before. You know, clean up this backlog of somebody that's sitting in jail for the next 20 years, a convicted offender. It's important to type that sample, that's true. But the person is in prison. 
right? It's more important to make sure that the sample is typed in the case of the victim, right? So that can be put into the database and we can see if it's somebody else. I'll tell you about a case in New York. Uh, we had a serial rapist, 17 cases were connected to each other. It wasn't immediately apparent to investigators that all 17 cases were related. It turned out that uh, this particular serial rapist usually wore a mask. And so, in most of these cases, the assailant couldn't make an identification or even give a description for a sketch. In one of the 17 cases, and we only knew they were related because we had DNA on unsolved cases right after it was committed, 17 of them. In the 17th case, the victim was able to pull the mask off the assailant and give a sketch that can then be distributed to police officers, and this was instrumental in leading to this man's capture. So you can see it is a powerful investigative tool. That's its power. So number one, you must not, under any circumstances, uh, impair the ability of these labs. And feed. you need to empower them. They don't have the capacity right now to do the new cases. That's number one. Number two, we have to deal with these old, unsolved cases, these rape kits before they're thrown away. Incidentally, there is legislation uh, being proposed in state after state. There's a simple way to do this to prevent the statute of limitations from running. You go into court, but well, first of all, you should pass a statute in each state that says, and they're doing it, uh, you can get a John Doe warrant against a DNA profile of an unsolved case where somebody has committed the crime. And that tolls the statute of limitations. So if the statute of limitations is five years or seven years, as long as that John Doe warrant is on file, you can pick that, that person up and prosecute them later. The model bill which I submitted to you, I believe, is one that uh, uh, Speaker Sheldon Silver has proposed in New York because it helps with the backlog issue. What, we, what Speaker Silver proposed is you can have, get this John Doe warrant and we'll extend the statute of limitations a year or two, but we'll also give additional money to our laboratories to type these unsolved rape kits before the statute runs. Okay, it's a much better idea than just abolishing statute of limitations, which frankly serve good purposes uh, to prevent people from being prosecuted on stale evidence. It shouldn't be infinite, but that's the way to do it. So we have these unsolved rape kits, unsolved homicides before the advent of DNA. We can go back now and get blood stains, hairs, all kinds of evidence, type it and solve unsolved homicides. So that is a key priority. A third priority ought to be post-conviction DNA testing. Now, as uh, Congresswoman uh, Schakowsky noted, there is this Innocence Protection Act sponsored by uh, uh, Delahunt and LaHood here in the House, and uh, I think a number of you are sponsors of that, and also in the Senate by uh, Senator Leahy and Gordon Smith. And I urge you to get this legislation passed this session. What it's going to do, in just one of its uh, provisions, is mandate any state that wants to be part of the DNA data banking system, and every state gets money, and every state wants to be, would have to pass a statute that said that an inmate has a right to get post-conviction DNA testing if it would raise a reasonable probability that they didn't commit the crime. Two states had this bill five, six years ago, New York, Illinois. It's not a coincidence that New York and Illinois have the most post-conviction DNA exonerations. Now we have bills passed, good bills in California, in Arizona, in Oklahoma. Frankly, there have been some bad bills passed. My aunt Florida passed a bill, uh, was just signed the other week. The bill says, okay, you can get a post-conviction DNA test, but you have two years to do it. Now, I can tell you, because we've been doing these cases, that it takes far longer if you're an inmate in prison and you don't have any money you don't have a right to a lawyer, you don't have a lawyer. You have to get transcripts, you have to find the evidence, 75% of the time the evidence is lost or destroyed. You have to make a proper presentation in court to get the DNA test under the statute. 
There have been 10 people exonerated from death row with post-conviction DNA testing. All 10 of them would have been dead under the Florida bill because they couldn't get the resources to make the application within two years. It's great to pass the Innocence Protection Act, but it's an unfunded mandate. What we have to have is um, allocation of resources um, so that we can get some of these people into court so they can get the DNA testing to prove their innocence. And I want to emphasize that in so many of these cases, once we find the convicted offender, we also find the real perpetrator, hopefully before that perpetrator commits more crimes. I call to your attention, uh, 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 Mr. Putnam and others, Florida. We've only had one post-conviction DNA exoneration in Florida. Frank Lee Smith, an inmate on death row, died trying to get the DNA test because under Florida law, he couldn't go into court to get the DNA test. The prosecutor denied the DNA test, refused to give it to him. He died in prison of cancer. The defense lawyers, we had maintained that there was a serial murder rapist named Eddie Lee Mosley who committed the crime that Smith had been convicted and put on death row for committing. The day Al Gore conceded, they leaked the fact that our friends at the FBI had done a DNA test after we had preserved the samples and prevented them from being destroyed, showing that Frank Lee Smith was innocent and Eddie Lee Mosley had in fact committed that crime. Some very wonderful detectives in the Fort Lauderdale area began developing evidence in another case of a man named Jerry Frank Townsend. He had pled guilty, ultimately, to rape murders, five of them, all right, two actually in Florida, to avoid the death penalty. Been convicted of three, two others in Miami, he pled guilty to. All five were convicted by, were committed by Eddie Lee Mosley, the serial offender. He was a mentally retarded man, Jerry Frank Townsend, who confessed to these crimes that he didn't commit. And there's others like it. And these are cases where if earlier we had been able to look at these post-conviction cases, we could prevent other uh, crimes from being committed because frequently it is serial offenders. And uh, it's, it's a, a, a wider set of victims. It's the victims of the crimes themselves and their families. And it's the inmates that are innocent and their families that are victims of all of this. Um, and we can't have these unfunded mandates. And I would suggest that we have a network of law schools now that are voluntarily coming forward, way overfunded. Come to our offices sometime. You see letters piled up to the ceilings that we haven't been even able to read. Um, and very small amount of money from the, uh, the federal government to fund projects uh, run by law professors, some of whom are former prosecutors or crime lab people, uh, to try to get into this backlog would be very efficient. And Mr. Check, am I understanding this correctly that New York has a 30-day waiting period in rape cases? A 30-day waiting, a 30-day waiting period, and I'm just curious what that means. Uh, is there a 30-day waiting period? Waiting period, and I'm just curious what that means. Uh, is there a 30-day waiting period in rape cases? You mean before the the, the testing can be done? I would imagine the turnaround. I, I'm not altogether sure my co colleagues here might be able to be more specific about what it is. We have different labs in, in the city of New York. We have a state lab. We have them in Suffolk County. Uh, I can't speak, uh, and I wouldn't well, want to we'll speak ask too quickly. Them but I know that the I know that the turnaround 30 days would be good <laughs> compared to what's going on in many jurisdictions. I have to tell you. Uh, now, another thing that I really would ask you to question my colleagues about in law enforcement, I've never understood this, dealing with the issue of the backlog. There are one million people, it is estimated, that are on parole or probation whose samples should be in the data bank because they've committed a violent felony and probably a rape or a homicide. But they're out on supervised release, they're on parole or probation. Okay, they're part of the backlog. We should be going out and getting their samples first. Now, I'll tell you what happened in the state of New York. Because we have this kind of unique forensic science commission, and we regulate the DNA data bank, we said to the uh, uh, state officials, look, we know that you have, you know, 
few hundred thousand samples, you've got a type of convicted offenders who are in prison. But we want you first to type the people that are on the street because they're the ones that can go out and commit the crime. So we want the people on probation, the people from rural tested first. And initially our officials came in and said, if that's too hard, it's much too hard because we have to go out and find them and we haven't trained our people. It's much easier to go into the prisons where they're already there and collect it from them. It's too hard, so we'll do those later. We said, no, 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 you've got to do those first. Now, this NBC case is a good example. Some people were complaining that we didn't, uh, this man was not captured soon enough, but he had been released from jail, but he was forced to come in and give his sample because he was on parole. And that's how he was located. Uh, uh, you, 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 it's one million people. Those should be the first people tested. Yet, when my colleagues from NIJ and uh, on our National DNA Commission sought to go and say, I wanted them to say, listen, if you're going to give money to the states, there ought to be conditional grants. They ought to get more money if they say they're going to clean up the backlog by typing the old samples, the people on the street first, rather than the people in prison. They say, well, you know, they'd rather not have the money than do that. It, that, that is, look, I'm just a law professor. I'm not one of these, you know, I, I don't understand it. It makes no sense. It is completely backwards. Maybe you can figure it out for us. Uh, but that's something that should be done. Uh, obviously, we have to do the convicted offender backlog. There's about 400,000 of them now, it's uh, estimated. Uh, what we did uh, in New York is that when they first come in, we type them right away, right after they're convicted. But we serve everybody that's about to leave uh, is typed before they get on the street. And that makes sense. I mean, if you're to do it, you should do it intelligently. The last people to be typed, frankly, are the ones that are doing, you know, 20 to 40 years, first get the people on the street. Another, and this would be my final point to you, uh, one of the things that I know uh, some of my friends at the FBI want to testify about, and, uh, and I know you noted it in, the, uh, in uh, opening remarks, uh, there is a new kind of DNA test uh, called mitochondrial DNA testing. This is a, an assay that allows uh, DNA to be taken directly from the shaft of the hair with the other kinds of DNA testing that we use for the data bank, the short tandem repeat STR, you would need a fleshy root of the hair. What we're finding is that microscopic hair comparisons is, in my judgment, junk forensic science. Uh, uh, repeatedly, uh, it, it can be shown that uh, this kind of comparison between an unknown hair and uh, known hairs is, is flawed and wrong. Uh, maybe my friends from the FBI will not uh, uh, like that as much, but what, uh, it's, it's been flawed, frankly, both on inclusions and on exclusions. We can show using this mitochondrial DNA testing. But what they will tell you, I'm sure, is that even when they have a good hair person from the uh, FBI, Agent Diedrich, looks at an old case where somebody was convicted on microscopic hair comparison testimony and looks at it, and Agent Diedrich, all right, says, okay, I agree with the examiner, this is a match. When they finally go to do mitochondrial testing, five to 10% of the time, the mito shows that the inclusion is inaccurate, all right? So it is a, a, we now have the capacity to look at these hair cases. And what we found uh, is that uh, when, we, uh, when we calculated it for 74 of the post-conviction exonerations, since our book Actual Innocence came out in February, there's an exoneration every 18 days, so, you know, how to keep up with it. <laughs> uh, I haven't calculated all the hairs, but out of the 74, 33 had microscopic hair comparisons. Now this is gonna be a big problem, and you have to find more money for mito testing, whether it's increasing the capacity of the FBI or outsourcing to other private laboratories. Right now in Oklahoma, there's a scandal. There's a chemist named Joyce Gilchrist, who was known for being a forensic scientist of questionable repute, even by her peers. The FBI has gone in and looked at eight of her cases, and in five instances, were very troubled by the results. Now, in Oklahoma, 1,400 of her cases have been at first isolated, and there will be certainly hundreds that will have to be reviewed. The state of Oklahoma alone, just for Gilchrist cases, has allocated $700,000 
to do DNA testing on these old cases to see if we can correct injustices. I am telling you right now that even though uh, uh, more attention should have been paid to Joyce Gilchrist as a forensic scientist, uh, this same kind of situation with the problems, the limits of microscopic hair comparison in all cases, it's in every state. It's in every state. And it is a comparatively more expensive test because it can cost presently uh, $1,000, $2,000 per hair. There may be ways that our friends will suggest of uh, funding some research to do some assays that are quicker screening procedures that will bring down the cost. But this is another priority that you're going to have to look at. So in closing, what I would really urge this committee to do is look for ways to uh, prioritize. Um, and, and, and we're not going to have as much money as is necessary, frankly, to do everything. But if you can do the new cases, you certainly can do the cases of these unsolved rape kits. Do those right away. Right? That's basic justice. If you can do the basic justice of allowing these people who are riding away in jail or on death row to get their chance to prove their innocence, which will also find the real perpetrator in many instances before they commit more crimes. If you go and get the old samples, the people that are on the street first, if you do all those things or find ways to stimulate our friends here to do it, uh, it would be a tremendous service and uh, really in the name of efficiency, which after all, I guess this subcommittee is all about. Thank you. We thank you. Uh, any of my colleagues, uh, the gentleman from Florida, have any questions? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Gentleman from Florida. Mr. Sheck, you, you summarized it there at the end. If you would, please restate your prioritization, your hierarchy of testing. Begin with death row. Next hit those people who are on the streets with parole, probation. Is that, are those your top two? I would, I would, um, I would hesitate to, number one, and I, I really want to emphasize this, crimes that are now being committed. I mean, a, a, a victim of a sexual assault. There's no excuse for not typing that case right away to see whether or not it matches other unsolved cases that lead to the investigation and apprehension of that individual. We must make sure that the labs have the capacity to do that. And it would be a terrible mistake, and this is my fear, that in the name of cleaning up backlog, right, the labs don't have that capacity. So we have to make sure they have that capacity, and I assure you, they do not have it now in various different states. Some states do. Florida is, is pretty good. Virginia has more capacity. But even in Virginia, uh, Paul Farrar complains all the time that he has these problems with the new cases. So that, I'd say you have to make sure that you don't, that's done first. I would say the old unsolved, and I include within that the post-conviction cases, because in a sense of somebody saying, I'm innocent, please test my case, that's you know, one that's in question, if a test could make a result, uh, make a difference in the case, and no DNA was ever done, okay? So there's that class of cases, and these rape kits, uh, the old unsolved cases. We, it, there's no excuse for not doing those right away. Then when you're going into the backlog issue, the first backlogs that I would do are the people that are on parole or probation. It's more important to get them there on the street these individuals might commit new crimes. The statutes say their samples should be in the data bank. The states are going to say to you, administratively, it's just too hard to find my parolee, to find my probationer, and bring them back and have them just take a swab, a buckle swab, roll it in the, the mouth, if that's the method of collection, and give it to the lab to do DNA typing. I find that ridiculous. That's what uh, my very well-intentioned colleagues are being told every time that they approach the state authorities. Some people are even saying to them, we won't take your money if that's the condition. It's too hard. Okay, let me change gears with you slightly. What would you say to those who are concerned about the privacy issues? How would you deal with that aspect of this? Well, privacy issues is a coming concern. Right now, as far as the federal system, the CODIS system is concerned, and the DNA uh, Identification Act of 1992, I know because I testified about it, that we had privacy protections built in. That is to say, you can only use 
the DNA profiles for identifying missing persons, identifying unknown crime samples, and matching it to convicted offenders. Where the privacy issue is coming to bear now is that as state and local authorities develop their own capacity to do DNA testing, they are creating parallel data banks. Uh, that is to say, you might call it a usual suspects data bank. I think everyone in our DNA commission was quite concerned that when uh, uh, Cecilia Krauss, uh, uh, a wonderful uh, examiner from Florida, put up an anonymous uh, a note on a listserv asking uh, crime lab uh, examiners, as far as your, when you're creating your own computerized data bank that's outside of the CODIS system, all right, um, what kind of samples do you put in there? Some of them actually emailed back, well, we put in the samples from rape victims or elimination samples or, you know, suspect samples. So think about it. Somebody is the victim of a crime. Uh, the sample is taken and put into a computerized data bank because the police think, well, maybe this victim, maybe she's a drug offender or maybe it's suspicious, or let's just keep it around, okay? Now, I'm not saying, I think most sensible crime lab people don't, you know, are not engaged in this practice, but some were. That whole development of uh, state and local data banks is unregulated for the most part. There are no privacy restrictions built into it, and I think that we're heading for some real trouble there, uh, and that uh, states really better get their act together and, and regulate that and put very, very strict privacy restrictions on it. Because I'm a, I'm a very big proponent of, of DNA testing and, and DNA data bank conducted correctly. But I think there is a healthy skepticism out there that if the government's got your DNA, God knows what they're going to do with it. And I don't think that sometimes our, my friends in law enforcement are acting in their own enlightened self-interest. They should put more privacy protections on themselves so that we don't have some kind of civil liberties disaster where you get a lot of opposition to this because people are fearful that insufficient privacy protections are in place. Unlike a fingerprint, the DNA is the key to the kingdom. I mean, it is an infinitesimally more uh, informative piece of information about any human being. So to the extent that as capacity grows and technology catches up with the backlog and we begin to expand these to other crimes, where down the hierarchy from rapists and murderers do you take these DNA samples? Do you take them from f forcible entries, suspects and, and, and convicted felons, DUI offenders, juvenile offenders, where in the hierarchy do you stop taking DNA samples? Well, I think that uh, uh, burglaries, I have to say, are a very important area to be doing DNA typing. And in truth, and I know some of the subsequent witnesses are going to talk about it, we really have to train law enforcement on how to collect the evidence correctly and make sure that they don't contaminate it because, and get confounding results. But burglaries are a very important area. In the United Kingdom, they really specialize in typing in burglaries. And so what you'll find is that a perpetrator might leave a blood at the, you know, the point of forced entry, might drink from this cup, right? And uh, in the course of the burglary, and leave the beer bottle or the cup there, and you can swab that, you can get the DNA pattern, and you can uh, find such offenders. And they do link up very often with even more serious offenses. So burglary is, is something to look at. Um, the more you expand the number of categories uh, that are included, the bigger the backlogs get. Everybody's going to tell you that right now. States are moving. At first, they were pretty much just limiting it to sexual assaults and murder. Now, quite rationally, they're expanding it to uh, even as far as all felonies. Okay? But interestingly enough, uh, our National DNA Commission recommended to the Attorney General that states not go to the point where they collect DNA from people at arrest. And I have concerns about for civil liberties reasons. Some of my colleagues share them. Some of them were less concerned about the civil liberties reason. But for practical purposes, everyone in our commission agreed that it would be uh, a nightmare. The states absolutely cannot cope with being uh, uh, forced to type everybody at arrest. Because right now, 
they have a million old samples of people who committed murders and rapes who are on the streets that they're not typing, right? They say we can't do it. They have, they're not able to type a murder or rape within seven to 10 days after the crime is committed. They have other backlogs. They can't do post-conviction DNA testing in great yeah. numbers. If you do all of that, and you spend a few billion solving that problem, then come back and talk to me about arrests. And we can discuss that issue. But it really is, a lot of this is common sense. And if you can get the priorities right, you're not only going to protect the innocent, but you're really going to uh, uh, protect victims in a profound way. It's common sense, it's good law enforcement, it's cost effective. Thank you. My, the challenge my to the committee is to get uh, the bureaucracies to respond to the priorities more sensibly. We're going to have to move on, and uh, you're certainly welcome to stay, Mr. Scheck, if you would. And uh, we have eight uh, on panel two. Uh, Mr. Adams, come forward. Uh, Mr. Boyd, uh, Mr. Asplund, and uh, Mr. Lawler. Well, but let's get the others in there, too. I'm asking him to stay. Uh, Mr. Coonrod, Mr. Down, Dr. Downs, Mr. Conley, uh, Mr. Lautridge. Thank you. Some of you uh, were here. Uh, if you would stand, raise your right hand, and affirm the oath that you solemnly swear a testimony you're giving before this subcommittee that uh, will be the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth. I do. The clerk will note that all of them have affirmed. And you may be seated. Yeah. Is there, could we begin with? Okay, Ms. Maloney, uh, we'll, we'll have to do it in uh, four minutes because these gentlemen have been waiting and uh, we need to move ahead. Yeah. I, I, I appreciate it, but I, I, I particularly want to welcome him from the great state of New York. And I wanted to ask him, from your experience and your work, uh, Mr. Sheck, do you think that there is a need for a standardized victim uh, physical evidence recovery kit? Apparently, some hospitals don't have them, and there isn't a standard. Do you believe we need a federal standard? There's no question, I think, that we do need a standard. I know that uh, Dr. Henry Lee and Robert Ganslin have issued a very interesting to report to NIJ about these rape kits, because the rape kit is the beginning of everything. If you have a sensitive and intelligent collection of the evidence, uh, you know, just think about a bite mark. What we find is that uh, I'll give you a case of a client we have in New York. Uh, a man named O'Donnell was convicted and sentenced to prison in a sexual assault case, but the intelligent collection of the samples, they were able to get saliva from the bite mark and do fingernail scrapings from the victim when she, uh, uh, you know, uh, scratched it and struggled with her assailant. DNA typing of the saliva from the bite mark and the fingernail scrapings matched the real assailant, whose profile is not in the data bank, and exonerated uh, Mr. O'Donnell, who I think did about uh, seven or eight years. But it was only because of the excellent collection in the, uh, the rape kit and the way that was handled that we were able to solve the crime. So it all begins with the rape kit, and that is absolutely critical, uh, Congresswoman. You, you mentioned uh, that we have limited resources, and we do. If, where should we put our limited resources, the top priority? Well, again, the, the ones I mentioned, and certainly the, the, the rape kit is, is certainly one of them. I, I don't know of one hospital or one law enforcement agency today that uh, shouldn't be using it in some fashion or form, and it would be uh, uh, really intelligent and cost effective to make sure that everybody was using a similar one so that we could adequately preserve uh, and collect the evidence. If you could make one legislative change, what would it be? Boy, that's a tough one. 
Um, well, this would be one of them, and uh, uh, certainly everything in concerning uh, uh, the capacity to type the old, the, the unsolved rape kits and the, the post-conviction ones. Those are, I would consider those unsolves very high on the list. Thank you. I have further questions, but I'd like to hear from the, from the witnesses. Thank you. Both uh, the majority and the minority staff can uh, pursue questions with all of this uh, and put it in the record at this point without objection. We're going to start with Mr. Adams. Dwight Adams is Deputy <coughs> Assistant Director of the Laboratory Division of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. Uh, Mr. Adams and others have uh, given us really marvelous uh, documents on this. Those are all automatically in once I call on you. The full text is there, and we'd like you to sort of summarize it and give us the high points. Mr. Thank Adams. you, Mr. Chairman and members of the subcommittee. And thank you for the opportunity to speak to you about a few of the FBI's experiences in working with local, state, and federal agencies to implement <coughs> forensic DNA analysis and our combined DNA index system or otherwise known as CODIS. CODIS began in 1990 as a pilot project involving 12 state and local forensic laboratories. During the initial testing phases, the comments and observations of those original state and local laboratories helped to steer the course for CODIS today. Before each upgrade is implemented in CODIS, those state and local laboratories have an opportunity to serve as beta test sites and continue to assist us today in ensuring that the software that we implement is responsive to their needs as users. Without this collaborative efforts uh, by these state and local laboratories, CODIS would not achieve the success that you read about in the papers every day. CODIS is currently installed in 137 laboratories in 47 states and another 24 laboratories in 12 countries internationally. The CODIS software ena enables state and local forensic laboratories to exchange and compare DNA profiles electronically, thereby linking serial violent crimes to each other and identifying suspects by matching DNA from crime scenes to convicted offenders. The FBI laboratory continues to provide CODIS software, installation, training, and user support at no charge to federal, state, and local laboratories. The concept behind CODIS is to create a database of states' convicted offender profiles and use it to solve violent crimes for which there are no suspects. As you know, all 50 states have DNA database laws that cover a wide variety of criminal offenses. All states collect DNA samples from offenders convicted of sex offenses. The overwhelming majority of states have expanded beyond their scope of the original laws which covered just sex offenses. In fact, our research indicates that now only three states cover only sex offenders. I've attached a chart of qualifying offenses uh, by states to my written statement, and of particular note is the fact that 10 states are now authorized to collect from all of their felony offenders. And it looks like another state, Texas, will soon be added to that group. We believe that eventually all states will be collecting from all convicted felony offenders. So far this year, proposals to expand the qualifying offenses has been introduced in 30 state legislators, with well over half of these proposals to include all felony offenders. State legislation serves as another example of how federal and state agencies have worked together to implement DNA database programs. Beginning with the ish, uh, issuance of <coughs> legislative guidelines in 1991, the FBI laboratory has provided technical assistance in the form of briefings on CODIS, review of draft legislation, and testimony before legislative committees to assist states in enacting DNA database legislation. In order to plan for CODIS in the future, the FBI has observed the implementation of these database programs and in states and, and has learned from each of their experiences. We realize from the steady expansion of state laws that CODIS of the future will need to quickly and efficiently search millions of DNA profiles and provide a platform that is less costly and more easily maintained by both those participating states 
as well as the FBI. And we have been working toward those CODIS enhancements. For example, the University of Tennessee has been developing a matching algorithm that could search millions of DNA profiles in minutes. We could not have reached that point without the assistance of the Florida Department of Law Enforcement because it's they who test that new search engine for us. With the recognition of DNA as a powerful identification tool, as evidenced by its use in both solving and reviewing cases from past decades, DNA databases are becoming an integral component of law enforcement's arsenal. One final example of cooperation among local, state, and federal laboratories, before I conclude, as well as a su suggestion for an area of future collaboration. As the PCR-based technologies were being introduced into forensic laboratories across the country, the FBI realized that standards would need to be established for this new technology, as had been done previously for the earlier technology. A criteria that is crucial to the proper use of DNA database implementation is the use of consistent technologies. We knew that we would have to establish core loci for the new technology in order for the national DNA database to be successful. The FBI convened a group of 21 federal, state, and local, as well as international forensic laboratories to validate what are known as the STR loci for use in CODIS. The FBI provided the samples and kits and reagents to all of these participating laboratories in order for them to validate the use of STR analysis. After many months of testing, the participating laboratories recommended 13 STR loci for use in CODIS. This recommendation was adopted by the FBI and is known as the 13 core CODIS loci. The future and yet untapped area that would significantly benefit the collabor from collaboration between local, state, and federal laboratories was mentioned earlier by Mr. Sheck. That involves mitochondrial DNA technology. Certain tissues like hairs, bones, and teeth have little or no nuclear DNA, but can often be successfully typed using mitochondrial DNA technologies. Biological evidence recovered from missing persons is often in advanced stages of decomposition with little or no nuclear DNA, but mitochondrial DNA can get results. After many years of research and validation, the FBI laboratory implemented testing using mitochondrial DNA in June of 1996. To date, we've completed nearly 700 cases. As its success and admissibility in, in the courts have grown, demands for its use have also grown. But those demands exceed the FBI laboratory's current or likely future capabilities. Having anticipated the need for other forensic laboratories to develop their own mitochondrial DNA capabilities, we began a training program in 1998, whereby we were training state and local laboratories to use this technology. As you know, CODIS includes a missing persons index, which can match the DNA profiles using mitochondrial DNA results. This index, however, contains very little DNA data because the FBI laboratory remains the only public crime laboratory conducting mitochondrial testing. This is an area ripe for collaboration between federal, state, and local laboratories. One solution might be a nationwide network of six to eight state and local forensic laboratories that could provide mitochondrial analysis to the criminal justice agencies across the country. The FBI laboratory could provide administration for the network, train the personnel, and ensure audit adherences to the quality assurance standards. The FBI is committed to support the CODIS program and to continue these beneficial collaborations with federal, state, and local forensic laboratories in implementing DNA technologies. One last comment. You heard the very poignant testimony of Mrs. Smith this morning talking about how the use of DNA and the use of CODIS has brought her life back to her once again. That has happened countless thousands of times across the nation. But I'm here to tell you that there are also thousands and thousands of victims whose crimes have not been solved, but they have hope. They have hope because this technology is out there, it's being used, but it could be used more successfully. Thank you.
thank you very much. That was a very useful statement. We now have uh, uh, Dr. Boyd, and uh, we're delighted to have you with us. <clears throat> thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you and the members of the committee for this opportunity to testify before you today. My office is the science and technology component of the National Institute of Justice, the research and evaluation arm of the Department of Justice. When NIJ first undertook to conduct research on DNA identification technology in the mid-1980s, it was a very new field, barely known, and not at all used in crime laboratories in the United States. Over the next 11 years, with a modest research and development investment of about $5 million, NIJ managed to fund, wholly or in part, every significant advance in DNA identification technology in the United States. Almost immediately after a former director brought DNA analysis methods from the United Kingdom to the U.S., in the mid-1980s, two private laboratories picked up the technology, followed by Virginia, Florida, and Minnesota, and then by the FBI, which meant that by 1989, there were only four DNA-capable crime laboratories and two private DNA laboratories in the United States. Seven years later, when NIJ began the DNA Laboratory Improvement Program, there were still fewer than a dozen crime laboratories in the United States capable of doing DNA analysis. But today, there are more than 130 laboratories in all 50 states capable of analyzing forensic DNA evidence. NIJ scientists work closely with the forensic community to provide them with the tools they need to work more efficiently and economically, and funded the development of accreditation and proficiency testing programs through the American Academy of Forensic Sciences and the American Society of Crime Laboratory Directors. This year, we've managed to find a better way to fund the analysis of DNA backlog samples so that every DNA dollar will buy about 30% more DNA samples this year than last and will allow us to support the analysis of DNA samples in states with backlogs too small to have been economically acceptable before. Working with the National Institute of Standards and Technology, we developed the Reference Materials Kit, now used in nearly every DNA-capable laboratory in the United States, to ensure consistency of analysis and reliability of results. In 1996, NIJ proposed, established, and funded the National Commission on the Future of DNA Evidence, about which you will hear more when Chris Aspen testifies. Much of the impetus for a number of congressional administration and state initiatives, including the recent reprogramming of $25 million of asset forfeiture money, has arisen from the work of this commission. We're working with the forensic community and a consortium of universities to identify the essential components of an acceptable curriculum for a degree in the forensic sciences, because laboratory directors tell us they have no confidence that someone with a forensic science degree actually has an adequate knowledge of the forensic sciences. The Forensic DNA Research and Development Program continues to provide enhancements to existing methods, techniques, and technologies, and to create new tools for the future of DNA evidence. Current projects aim to reduce the risk of loss of crucial evidence to equipment failures, to develop a mitochondrial DNA screening method that allows labs to examine old, degraded, or very small evidence samples without resorting to expensive and technically demanding DNA sequencing methods, to develop high-throughput, low-cost mass spectrometry instrumentation, and to exploit nanotechnology for forensic applications. We expect the first forensic nanotechnology project, a DNA chip with all 13 of the required genetic markers for databasing, will be in the hands of practitioners for evaluation by the end of this year. This inexpensive chip can produce a reliable result in under five minutes instead of the several hours currently required, thus saving thousands of analyst years of productivity. This chip may even eventually offer new ways to use DNA earlier in investigations. Unfortunately, as a recent RAND report notes, the laboratories are so overwhelmed by a lack of human resources that infusion of new technology is incredibly difficult at best. It is therefore imperative that we work to create an environment where crime laboratories can function beyond case triage and start performing the work that will save the entire criminal justice system time and resources. It is that critical investigative stage where forensic analysis can rule out suspects, direct leads with real data, and help solve crimes more quickly and more accurately than can canvassing and eyewitness interviews that require the use of already overburdened investigators. Supporting the full modernization and upgrading of our nation's crime laboratories 
means more than just saving time and money. It means saving lives, stopping crimes, and promoting public safety in a very real, tangible way. We believe we've made great progress in enhancing the ability of public crime labs to analyze forensic DNA evidence. But we also believe we have only just begun to realize the full potential of this powerful technology. I'd be happy to answer any questions you might have. Thank you very much. And I underline your testimony where you say that uh, from the National Commission on Future of DNA Evidence is the commission has 22 nationally renowned scientists, attorneys, jurists, academics, bioethicists, victims, advocates, and members of law enforcement. And you've come to the conclusion that there's a backlog of approximately 750,000 collected but unanalyzed convicted offender samples. So that's something we really have to deal with. We now go to the uh, next gentleman, Mr. Asplund, Executive Director, National Commission on the Future of DNA Evidence and Assistant United States Attorney. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and other members of the subcommittee. I greatly appreciate the opportunity to be here today. In many respects, how efficient and effective we are at integrating DNA technology into our criminal justice system has a direct effect on how safe our streets and neighborhoods are, what crimes we solve, and ultimately, what crimes we prevent. I look forward to sharing with you a bit of the national perspective as observed by the Commission. The Commission was established in 1998 by the Department of Justice and has as its mission the maximization of the value of DNA technology in the criminal justice system. The Commission's 22 scientific, ethics, and legal experts, as well as over 50 Commission working group members, have considered a broad range of issues arising from the use of DNA. I will take this opportunity to discuss two areas which I believe pertain most directly to the issue of efficiency, law enforcement training and education, and database backlogs. One of the clearest impediments to the effective and efficient use of DNA is law enforcement's limited training regarding how to properly identify, preserve, and collect biological material that may yield the DNA profile of a perpetrator. Significantly limited training resources, sparingly applied to a complex and ever-changing and improving technology, often results in a failure to take full advantage of the power of DNA. Police departments are often forced to choose, for example, between essentials like bulletproof vests and the education necessary to prevent the contamination of evidence. All too often, important biological evidence is missed or contaminated because first responding officers are not aware of the potential to find DNA on the saliva of a cigarette butt or the invisible skin cells left on the handle of a murdering baseball bat. Recognizing law enforcement's need, the Commission developed a number of training tools to educate, educate the entire law enforcement community. The immediate success of and demand for these materials is testament to law enforcement's desire to take full advantage of DNA. The first tool developed was, uh, by the Commission was the pamphlet, What Every Law Enforcement Officer Should Know About DNA Evidence. And this pamphlet will be provided to all of the subcommittee members and all the committee members, as well as the, uh, the CD-ROMs be put in the record at this point. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, the pamphlet explains the biology of DNA, the CODIS database, contamination, and lists examples of what of evidence that may contain a perpetrator's DNA. Because the first printing run of one million copies was depleted in five months, NIJ committed to another 500,000 copies, totaling 1.5 million. The pamphlet was then converted into two interactive CD-ROMs. NIJ is already receiving state requests to provide one to every officer. Our initial supply of CD-ROMs, however, is a limited 124,000 for both. The tangible benefits of this educational tool, particularly the pamphlet, were quickly made apparent. Within six months, a rape homicide was solved directly as a result of that pamphlet. Authorities in Texas investigating the strangulation rape homicide of a woman sent the cord used to strangle the victim to the laboratory specifically for DNA testing. Now, while the cord would have been collected at ev as evidence in the ordinary course of the investigation, this time it was submitted for DNA analysis because one of the investigators read the pamphlet identifying ligatures as potential sources of DNA. After a match to the perpetrator, it was determined that the suspect in an attempt to avoid capture by DNA, 
had worn a condom, not only a condom, but also rubber gloves. However, when struggling with his victim in the process of strangling her, one hand was required to hold her down while the other hand grabbed the cord wrapped around her neck. The only thing left to pull the other end tight enough to kill his victim was his mouth, thereby depositing saliva and thus his DNA on that cord. He was, he was subsequently linked to several other murders. The pamphlet's success is illustrative of two important points. The first is the tremendous need by law enforcement for these kinds of training materials. When available and economically feasible, law enforcement has taken advantage of educational opportunities. The second, however, is the important role the federal government can and did play in improving the efficiency and effectiveness of DNA through education. Now, effective DNA database utilization is, at its very core, all about efficiency. Absent the analysis of crime scene DNA sample and its comparison to the convicted offender database, crimes are solved in the traditional fashion. Manpower is used to track down leads and establish an array of suspects. Each suspect must be examined and investigated, which uses valuable financial and human resources. The time and money spent on every wrong suspect is time and money wasted when a rapidly analyzed crime scene sample run through the database could potentially solve the case. Our use of DNA technology only becomes more effective and efficient as we move the point of analysis closer to the time the crime was committed. A crime scene sample that takes six months to analyze, and under current circumstances, please understand, six months is a relatively quick turnaround time. That means six more months of human and financial costs. Six more months of time and money tracking down suspects who are the wrong suspects, Six more months of innocent people being caught in a web of suspicion that even if they are ultimately not arrested, carry a lifelong stigma by nature of the investigation. And every day, crimes are committed by individuals who could be arrested by DNA technology for previous crimes, but are not because of the forensic and convicted offender backlogs and because of the lack of laboratory infrastructure. Our success at optimizing DNA technology will depend on our commitment to law enforcement and our forensic laboratories. The number of lives we save from victimization will be in direct relation to law enforcement's ability to identify, preserve, and collect the evidence, and our laboratory's ability to quickly analyze that evidence and enter that profile into the DNA database. Again, I appreciate the opportunity to be here today, and I look forward to any questions that you might have. Thank you very much. Our next uh, presenter is the Honorable Michael Lawler, State Representative, Connecticut General Assembly, and coming here as the National Conference of State Legislatures. Uh, that's uh, all 50 states. Plus so, a few territories, Mr. Chairman. That's <laughs> correct. Well, Mr. Chairman, uh, good morning. Uh, thanks to you and to Representative Maloney. I know both of you uh, agreed that uh, the NCSL was an appropriate a group to have at the table this afternoon, and, and, I, and I appreciate the opportunity on their behalf. Uh, let me just indicate, since like you, I'm an elected official, I represent East Haven in the short beach part of Brantford in the Connecticut Legislature, and I think they'd be happy to hear me say that. Uh, but more importantly, I chair the Judiciary Committee in our legislature, and, uh, and for the past two years, I've been the chair of the Law and Justice Committee of the National Conference of State Legislatures, which is our policy-making uh, uh, board. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I think that 10 years ago when DNA as an issue in the criminal justice uh, system first emerged on the scene, I think many of my colleagues were nervous about the implications of this new concept. But I think uh, most of the concerns and really most of the philosophical objections to this process have, have uh, faded away. And now we're left with the practical aspects of this. And I'd like to uh, highlight a few of the statistics that are included in my written testimony this morning, but I'd encourage you to take a look at that as well, since I really don't have time to get to all of them. But as has already been pointed out, all 50 states since 1994 have uh, required that all convicted sex offenders ha uh, provide DNA samples to be cataloged. And in addition to that, 34 states require many other violent felonies, uh, persons convicted of many other violent felonies to provide samples. 26 states have a similar requirement for juvenile offenders. Uh, 18 states are now online with the CODIS system, as I understand it. And just last year, nine states have added a, a wide variety of new offenses to the list of crimes, uh, convictions for which uh, require a, a sample to be provided. 
New York, for example, last year went from 21 crimes to 107 crimes. And I think we've already talked about the practical implications of those policy changes. It's extraordinarily expensive and complicated to ensure that, notwithstanding the law requiring it, that the system actually does collect those samples and properly catalogs them. Um, and uh, in addition, uh, Alaska, Colorado, and Florida have extended the requirement to submit DNA samples to certain probationers. Uh, with Colorado and Florida measures also adding burglary to the list of offenses for which a DNA sample is required. In uh, West Virginia, an enactment adds offenses that include extortion, involuntarily, involuntary manslaughter, burglary, counterfeiting, certain larceny and arson crimes uh, to the list. In New Jersey, uh, my colleagues have added homicide, assault, kidnapping, and luring offenses committed by adults or juveniles. And California will collect samples from qualifying offenders who were convicted in other states. And Georgia law expanded the list of sex crimes that require a sample. Other states made procedural changes in collection of samples, among them measures in Arizona, Colorado, Georgia, and Iowa, requiring that samples be collected from qualifying offenders before they are released from custody. And I think every state is, in, in essence, heading in that direction. And that's the important thing I wanted to emphasize today. Uh, and in particular, in my state, in Connecticut, uh, we've been collecting uh, samples from sex offenders for a long time. We're also blessed with the leadership of Dr. Henry Lee, who's already been mentioned here today. He has been the head of our uh, crime lab in Connecticut and is our former commissioner of public safety and also of OJ fame. I think everyone knows Dr. Lee. But he has really been the spiritual leader for this concept in Connecticut, and he's convinced many skeptical colleagues of mine that this is uh, as important for victims as it is for offenders who may be wrongfully convicted. Uh, just last year, in fact, with this in mind, Connecticut retroactively extended backwards its statute of limitations for sex offenses, uh, reaching back 20 years to the advent of DNA as a technology um, to ensure that persons where these crimes were uh, reported in a timely fashion to the police, if they're apprehended now as a result of the DNA identification, the prosecution can go forward with or without a John Doe warrant. And I think that's an important uh, change. And at the same time, in the same bill, Connecticut made it clear that we would no longer have a limitation on a request for a new trial where the basis for that request is new DNA evidence. In other cases, there's a three-year limitation on the time uh, for which people can request a new trial after conviction. This year, Connecticut considered, and our, and our session has just ended, but this year we considered extending the requirement of collecting DNA to all convicted felons, which has been discussed earlier. That, unfortunately, fell by the wayside. It's a tight budget year in Connecticut, as it is in many states. Uh, but our fiscal note on that proposal indicated it would cost uh, $552,000 to test just the 4,700 offenders currently incarcerated in our state. Uh, and that's a half a million dollars we just didn't have to spend. It may not seem like a lot of money to you, but in a tight budget, uh, which we're experiencing in our state, and that's Connecticut, the wealthiest state in the nation, it's, it's actually a problem. So we would welcome some federal assistance in that regard. Uh, Mr. Chairman, the jurisdiction of this committee is intergovernmental affairs, and I think that is a topic that the National Conference of State Legislatures is very concerned about. And I wanted to mention a couple of considerations which I hope you will make as you consider the, the concepts being discussed today. First of all, uh, keep in mind uh, that flexibility uh, ought to be the hallmark of any uh, policy change on the federal level, such as the ones that are being discussed today. Uh, keep in mind that sex offender statutes, probation, parole, the concept of juvenile, uh, all have different meanings in different states. So when persons talk about parole in Connecticut, it's a very, very different concept than when it's being discussed in New York, just for example. In Connecticut, Juveniles are persons under the age of 16, but we're one of only three states that treats all 16-year-olds as adults. And when federal mandates uh, treat, uh, have a one-size-fits-all fits type, uh, uh, type uh, mandate, uh, then that does create unanticipated and unintentioned problems around the country. And Connecticut, for example, doesn't even have county government at all. And many of the uh, proposals here talk about uh, funneling money to the county government level. Uh, and, and in many states, prison has a different concept. Uh, in Connecticut, we have no county jails. We only have a State Department of Corrections. And so uh, mandates well-intentioned tend to confuse things on the ground level. Uh, I point out in recent years, uh, in juvenile justice reform proposals, in the end, 
uh, the differences that each state has in, in designing its criminal justice system have been taken into account. I would only encourage you to do that in this regard. And finally, I'd just like to indicate that there is a, a, a very important role the federal government can play on this topic, and that is allowing states and localities to come together in national forums and compare best practices to find out what's working and what's not working in other states as we determine what we should accept in our states. And just as important when it comes just as important as the DNA technology and how to apply it to convicted offenders is the issue of privacy. I think that's really been the frustrating factor for many state legislatures as we want to make the criminal justice change, but we're nervous about uh, other ways that this information could be uh, misused, for example, and, and concerns that people bring forward. And that kind of stops some of this legislation dead in its tracks. If we could meet on a national basis with federal, state, and local policymakers and, and discuss through uh, ways that we can enact appropriate safeguards. I think that would open the door to uh, the kind of widespread collection of DNA uh, samples that have been discussed here today. Uh, I think the partnership we've forged in recent years can work effectively, and I look forward to helping in that regard in any way I can or the NCSL can. So thank you very much. Thank you very much uh, for coming. We now uh, move to Keith Kenneth Coonrod. He's chair of the Consortium of Forensic uh, Science Organizations, New York State Police Forensic Investigation Center. And I uh, take it uh, you're uh, director of toxicology, drug chemistry, trace, breath testing in the forensic laboratory system. And uh, I see you're chair of the consortium of uh, forensic science organizations, which comprises seven leading forensic organizations. And you might want to spell those out. So uh, we're glad to have you here. You have a lot of uh, authority and academic uh, uh, recognition. Good morning, Mr. Chairman and members of the subcommittee. I'd like to thank the subcommittee for this opportunity to provide testimony here today regarding the role of state and local crime laboratories and how they interact with the federal government. My name is Keith Coonrod. and I'm currently employed by the New York State Police as Director of Toxicology, Drug Chemistry, Trace, Breath Testing, and the Forensic Laboratory System. And I'm here as a chair of the Consortium of Forensic Science Organizations, which comprises of seven leading forensic organizations, which include the American Society of Crime Laboratory Directors, known as ASCLAD, which represents over 400 crime laboratory managers and directors from local, state, and federal crime laboratories. I'm currently president of this organization. The American Society of Crime Laboratory Directors Laboratory Accreditation Board, known as ASCLAD Lab, which is the accrediting body for forensic crime laboratories, for which I'm currently an ex-officio member of the Board of Directors, and I've been team captain responsible for many inspections of laboratories undergoing the accreditation process. The International Association for Identification, known as IEI, which is the oldest and largest forensic identification association in the world. The American Academy of Forensic Sciences, known as AAFS, which is a professional organization representing numerous forensic specialties such as criminalistics, engineering sciences, jurisprudence on ontology, pathology, biology, physical anthropology, psychiatry and behavioral sciences, question documents, toxicology, and multidisciplinary general section. The National Association of Medical Examiners, known as NAME, which represents medical examiners, coroners, and other physicians who conduct death investigations. The National Forensic Science Technology Center, known as NFSTC, which is dedicated to assisting forensic science facilities to achieve the highest quality of operations. And finally, the National Center for Forensic Science, known as NCFS, which provides research, education, training, tools, and technology to meet the needs of forensic science, investigative, and criminal justice agencies. While the public thinks of forensics as DNA, it is essential that the committee understand that this is just one of the many tools available to the criminal justice community by our forensic laboratories. Although DNA is indeed an important discipline, forensic science is broadly defined as the examination of all evidence submitted by criminal justice agencies to forensic laboratories for the purpose of determining how that evidence pertains to the law and or the courts. Forensic laboratories support the criminal justice community by offering services in clandestine laboratory investigations, explosives analysis, controlled substance analysis, firearms examinations, alcohol analysis, tool mark examinations, toxicology, impression evidence, arson analysis, trace evidence examinations, death investigations, digital evidence, physical match, crime scene investigations, training, as well as biological examinations, including DNA. 
While over 90% of all forensic examinations are conducted by local and state crime laboratories in the United States, it is important that local, state, and federal laboratories maintain a close working relationship with one another. There is no single local, state, or federal laboratory that can possibly meet the vast needs of the criminal justice community. Currently, there exists a close working relationship between the nation's local and state laboratories and the various federal laboratories. Let me provide you with just a few examples. The DEA laboratory provides a training course for new forensic drug chemists from local and state crime laboratories. This supplemental training provides viable information as well as advanced technical information gathered from DEA laboratories. The DEA also provides assistance to local and state laboratories in many other drug-related issues, such as clandestine laboratory seizure training, awareness of newly encountered drugs, and technical support in cases involving drugs rarely encountered or analyzed. The New York State Police Laboratory recently sponsored a Northeast Regional Quality Assurance Seminar with assistance from the FBI laboratory. Attendees from Maine to New Jersey enrolled in this course, which was designed to assist non-accredited laboratories with the identification and implementation of numerous quality principles and practices. The class was held at the New York State Police Forensic Investigation Center and taught by instructors from New York State Police, as well as FBI and instructors from other organizations. With local and state laboratories providing the backbone of forensic analysis for our nation's criminal justice community, insufficient resources are available to these laboratories to meet demands. These laboratories must focus their limited resources on examination of cases versus extended training or research and development of new technologies critically needed by the forensic community. While federal laboratories play a major role in providing valuable assistance in areas such as extended training, research, and development, it remains the mission of our nation's local and state laboratories to support the needs of their criminal justice agencies. Finally, Mr. Chairman, I'd like to thank the members of the committee for passing the Paul Coverdell National Forensic Science Improvement Act. Um, what I have mentioned, what I've tried to bring out to this committee is the importance of, as Mr. Sheck said, a very broad support, as I've said, forensic science is made up of not only DNA, many other sections. For instance, our laboratory, I'm in charge of the trace section. Evidence that we see today did not exist five years ago uh, for potential DNA analysis. Today, we get in bags of vacuum cleaner bags in which we're being asked to look for a particular hair that might be one of thousands of hairs uh, to determine if it's probative for subsequent DNA analysis. And this is being done by the trace section. So the point that I would like to make to this committee is the importance of broad support of forensics to all disciplines, not just DNA, because DNA affects the complete laboratory, which is made up of multiple disciplines. As you know, we're working towards appropriating uh, the law this year and appreciate your support in this matter. Again, Mr. Chairman, thank you for the opportunity to testify before the committee, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you very much. That's very helpful because I do want to get into that with Ms. Maloney in terms of the forensics and uh, the laboratories that you've seen. So uh, we will now go to uh, uh, Dr. Jamie Downs, the Director and Chief Medical Examiner of the Alabama Department of Forensic Science. Dr. Downs, glad to have you here. Thank you, Chairman Horn and distinguished committee members for the privilege of coming before you today. As director of one of the few fully integrated forensic laboratory medical examiner systems in our country, and as a practicing forensic pathologist myself, I hope to bring to you a perspective from the state and local level on the status of our nation's forensic laboratory systems. An ideal forensic laboratory requires three things, objectivity, competent and dedicated employees, and resources. The creation of Alabama's forensic system was tied in large part to a tragic miscarriage of justice related to evidence, DNA evidence. The 1931 cases of nine young black men, known as the Scottsboro Boys, who were unjustly convicted of rape, pointed out the absence of a competent and impartial forensic agency within our state. In 1935, Alabama's legislature changed that by creating our department to serve as independent and unbiased scientists charged with the collection and analysis of scientific evidence. Our scientists are certified as peace officers and have the power to enter any crime scene in the state for the purpose of securing evidence. All reports of our investigations, both on the scene and in the lab, are public record. These reports clearly indicate factual results and scientific expert opinions based on those results. If I could, allow me to walk you through a typical homicide case recently broadcast on television, and I've uh, submitted a copy for introduction into the record if that's acceptable. 
in May of 1994. That objection, that'll be in the record at this point. Thank you, Chairman. In May of 1994, the badly beaten body of an 85-year-old woman was found floating in a pond. Her elderly son was the suspect. At the scene, our department recovered a cigarette butt. The evidence was taken to our DNA section and later proved to have the son's DNA on the surface. At trial, the defense challenged the evidence, questioning how it had been collected, stored, transported, and analyzed. Because this case had been handled properly, there was no difficulty in chain of evidence or in having the criminalistics expertise on hand for pre-trial and courtroom presentation. Because I had found that cigarette butt at the scene and personally transported it to the lab, I was able to not only testify as to the handling of the evidence, but also to produce on the stand a scene photograph of the evidence. The successful prosecution of this case hinged on that cigarette butt. That was possible because the local laboratory had done its job. This story is not unique. It happens every day in medical examiner and forensic laboratories across our country. It happens because good people who care do their jobs. On the whole, you will find no finer group of employees than our nation's forensics personnel. Our difficulty then is not with a question of neutrality or ability. Rather, it has been a question of resources, more accurately, a lack of resources. My parents taught me a long time ago, you get what you pay for. If you want quality, you have to be prepared to pay for it. In the business world, income must meet expenses in order to make ends meet. We have to make ends meet in the realm of forensic sciences, and we can only adjust three things, quantity, quality, and timeliness. Quantity of evidence is beyond our control. Cases are made based on evidence coming in and being analyzed. Quality is not on the table. One doesn't strive for mediocrity in any area, particularly when someone's life literally hangs in the balance. That leaves only timeliness. We work as many cases as quickly as we can, but our caseload has grown while our budgets have stayed level. The result is staggeringly large backlogs delays in issuing the reports. Six months in drug cases, 12 months in toxicology, 21 months in DNA. Competent, complete, and timely analysis of forensic evidence is expensive, very expensive. My department's annual budget is approximately $15.5 million for some 80,000 cases, or about $195 per case. In the area of DNA analysis, our agency spends approximately $140 per DNA sample analyzed, about $25 for each CODIS database sample, and over $135,000 for each cold CODIS hit. Is it worth it? Ms. Smith spoke to that issue. I can't answer the question except to say that a victim or their family, the answer would be obvious. Consider, if you would, the plight of a father who came to me recently to ask if evidence in the rape of his 12-year-old daughter had shown who, it's, who had violated his little girl. Imagine his surprise when I told him that the six months he had already been waiting was really not all that long, since the average wait time in Alabama was almost two years for DNA analysis. Consider if, for purely financial reasons, we had to limit the number of samples our lab could process in a case. In this 12-year-old's rape, two pair of panties had been recovered. Suppose we only could look at one. I hope we get the right one. This case points out the importance of skilled crime lab analysts available locally to screen and process evidence in order to maximize the value of what evidence is collected at the crime scene. Good scene work is the evidence of all forensic sciences and all medical examiner work, including but not limited to DNA evidence. If we learned nothing from the case of the people versus O.J. Simpson, we learned that the existence of evidence alone is not sufficient. All evidence must be collected, stored, and analyzed competently, expeditiously, and impartially if our court system is to work as designed, that is, to ensure justice. We must recognize and accept the old adage that one cannot be all things to all people. Federal support should be directed at complementing rather than supplanting the state and local forensic efforts. Crime scene work is best handled on a local basis. If we are to ensure that the public, law enforcement, district attorneys, defense attorneys, judges, and the courts have fair access to the truth, we must strive for sufficient resources at the state and particularly the local level 
to provide personnel, facilities, and equipment. Now, rarely there are needs for highly specialized tests. A system should not be inverted to work to the rarity, but should maximize services provided to the most people. We must first ensure that the local and state forensic laboratory has the ability to meet the needs of the population served. In an area of limited resources, we must target available funds where they will do the most good. Put that another way, if 99 out of 100 forensic cases are delayed due to the inability to perform toxicology analysis and one out of 100 is due to the lack of DNA infrastructure, then we should address the greater need first. Put the money where it will do the most good for the most people. The recently passed Paul Coverdell National Forensic Sciences Improvement Act directs significant federal assistance to state and local crime labs, but is as yet unfunded. The real strength of this law is that it requires states to formally adopt a plan to deal with local and statewide forensic and medical examiner issues as a condition of receiving funding. For the first time, states will have to implement a plan to deal with all involved interests within a state. Now that is a reform that creates efficiency in government. I humbly suggest we not stop there. I believe a national commission on the future of forensic laboratories should be established. Said commission should allow representatives of local, state, and federal crime lab and medical examiner communities to come together with various nationally recognized independent scientific authorities, the judiciary community, district attorneys, defense bar, and investigating agencies. This would allow the various states and concerned federal entities to create a broad vision for the future of all forensic laboratory and medical examiner concerns nationwide. In working together, we can successfully complete the fundamental mission of all crime laboratories and medical examiners. My department's mission statement is simple, to strive for excellence in all endeavors, to seek to serve as stewards of the public trust, to find the truth, whatever that might be and not to yield to forces which would attempt to compromise the former, to strive, to seek, to find, and not to yield. Will full funding for the Coverdell Act and the DNA Backlog Elimination Act of 2000, a lack of resources will not continue injustice through continuing delays in evidence analysis. We have the desire. We have the ability. We lack the resources. The nation's crime labs are literally drowning in a sea of DNA and all other types of evidence. We ask for your help before we go under for the final time. Thank you very much for your attention on this important matter. Well, thank you. That's very helpful. And I'll get back to your proposal on National Commission on the uh, Future of Forensic Laboratories uh, when we go to the questioning. Uh, we now have Mr. Conley. Uh, Mr. Robert S. Conley is chairman of the American Society of Crime Laboratory Directors and the Laboratory Accreditation Board. He is also director of the Indiana State Police Laboratory System. Mr. Conley. Thank you and good morning. Uh, I'm speaking to you this morning as the chairman of the American Society of Crime Lab Directors Laboratory Accreditation Board commonly referred to as ASCLAD Lab. Our accreditation program was initiated by the American Society of Crime Lab Directors. The first accreditation occurred in 1982. In 1984, the Laboratory Accreditation Board, by plan, became independent of ASCLAD, assuring autonomy in the management of the accreditation process. During the program's first 14 years, 131 laboratories were accredited. During the last five years, 83 additional laboratories have become accredited, bringing the total to 214. Of these, 199 are within the United States. At this time, there are 21 applications pending uh, from new laboratories entering the program and 15 more applications are anticipated by the end of the year. At year's end, we hope to have approximately 235 laboratories accredited. There are, however, over 200 labs still not accredited. I'd like to briefly characterize the ASCLAD Lab Accreditation Program this morning. An accredited laboratory must use internally validated written procedures. 
maintain training programs in each functional discipline, and competency test new employees before they perform casework. Reports are subject to systematic technical review to assure that findings and conclusions are supported by case file documentation. Scientists are subject to educational standards and they must participate in a proficiency testing program. The accreditation board monitors the laboratory's proficiency test performance. The security, the, uh, the security of the laboratory and the integrity of evidence under its control must be demonstrated, precluding its contamination or deleterious change. An accredited laboratory must have a functional quality system that ensures appropriate corrective actions remediate any deficiency identified by proficiency testing, casework review, audits, or any other means. These requirements and a host of others are verified by a stringent external review, an audit conducted by trained inspectors who are currently employed in accredited laboratories. A laboratory must audit and report its continuing compliance with the program standards. The accreditation board reserves the right to inspect a laboratory upon an indication of noncompliance. It has a procedure to consider evidence of noncompliance and to impose sanctions, including the revocation of accreditation. Regarding DNA specifically, Asklein Lab has historically supported the will of Congress to assure the quality of DNA analysis performed in accredited laboratories. Upon passage of the DNA Identification Act of 1994, our program standards were modified to incorporate the requirement to comply with guidelines developed by the Technical Working Group for DNA Analysis, TWIGDAM. Upon publication of the Quality Assurance Standards for Forensic DNA Testing, those standards were incorporated in place of the TWIGDAM guidelines. Additionally, the board entered into a memo of understanding with the FBI laboratory to conduct an approved audit of the Quality Assurance Standards to document each accredited lab's compliance with the congressional intent to ensure the integrity of the forensic analysis of DNA and the combined offender DNA indexing system. In closing this morning, I feel I must comment on the funding matter. As you can imagine, with the increased reliance on forensic science by the criminal justice community, we have received an influx of new applications and an increased obligation to periodically inspect accredited laboratories. Coupled with the board's intention to attain recognition as an international standards organization accrediting body, the board is at a crossroads financially. While we recognize that the Paul Coverdale National Forensic Sciences Improvement Act requires grant recipients to be accredited or to prepare and apply for accreditation, that act is not funded. Laboratory budgets remain insufficient to meet criminal justice needs. We therefore believe that the act should not only be funded, but should include funds to be set aside supporting the accreditation process in addition to the operation of the laboratories. Mr. Chairman, this morning I'd like to submit a copy of our accreditation manual uh, for the express purpose of a review by the committee, and I will remain available to answer any of your questions uh, pursuant to that review. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, and that document will be put in the record at this point without objection. Uh, I think uh, that would be very helpful to a lot of people who would uh, want to study that manual that you've just presented. Uh, we now have the last presenter, uh, Mr. Kevin L. Lowthridge, Deputy Director, Director of Strategic Development of the National Forensic Science Technology Center. We're glad to have you here. Well, great. Good afternoon, Chairman Horn and members of the subcommittee. I'm pleased to have this opportunity to discuss with you my organization's role in assuring the quality of the work of the nation's crime laboratories and to act as a resource. Uh, in a past life, I am a former director of an accredited crime lab and past president of the American Society of Crime Lab Directors, ASCLAD. I'm also a diplomat of the American Board of Criminalistics, this personal certification board. 
The NFSTC was established by the American Society of Crime Lab Directors in 1995 and began operating in July of 1996. It's an independent, not-for-profit organization located in Largo, Florida. Its operations are supported by federal funding and by recovery of costs directly from client laboratories. The vision of the NFSTC is all forensic science services will have the complete confidence of users and the community. And our mission is to help all of forensic science achieve the highest quality of operation. It achieves this by providing services such as accreditation of forensic DNA testing facilities to the congressionally mandated national DNA standards, uh, provision of certified standard materials to validate test methods and the competency of analysts, and training and education programs to ensure that the analysts have the skill and knowledge to conduct their tests. Good science is the bedrock of service quality in crime laboratories. However, good science does not just happen. It requires substantial resources to provide the physical plant, scientific equipment, and skilled personnel required to protect the integrity of the evidence, ensure that it receives timely, fault-free analysis, and ensure that the subsequent testimony is fair and accurate. Having reviewed the operation of over 100 of the nation's crime laboratories in the last five years, I can tell the subcommittee that there is a very wide range of levels of resourcing and performance. Service quality demands that sufficient resources are provided to ensure that these standards continue to be met. Maintenance of quality also requires that appropriate operational infrastructures be put in place. The forensic science community has been working toward the use of a triad of processes to assure the quality of work that is performed in crime laboratories across the country. This triad of accreditation, individual certification, and competency testing has made the profession stronger. Accreditation addresses the systems that are in place in the laboratory. Certification addresses the skill and knowledge of the analyst, and competency testing measures the ongoing performance achieved by the accreditation and certification. We are fortunate that there already exists both a well-developed accreditation program provided by the American Society of Crime Lab Directors Laboratory Accreditation Board, and a well-developed certification program provided by the American Board of Criminalistics. However, these organizations are currently funded by fees and were established within the community of service providers and experience all the resource-related issues that such organizations face. In contrast, the NFSTC is an entirely independent organization, it does not have a conflict of interest by also being service provider directed, and has a staff of full-time professionals. The NFSTC's services complement and provide vital support to the accreditation and certification programs of ASCLAD Lab and the ABC. NFSTC also provides the vital third step in the quality triad for providing competency standards to crime laboratories. The NFSTC is also providing leadership in bringing together organizations to avoid needless duplication and to leverage effective contributions to quality. For example, we are a member of the Forensic Resource Network being institutionalized by the NIJ Office of Science and Technology to assist state and local crime laboratories. We cooperated with the FBI and ASCLAD Lab to develop a uniform checklist for auditing DNA laboratories. And we are using some of our uh, funding to provide a national DNA lo laboratory audit service to laboratories in the CODIS database. Mr. Chairman, I've attempted to describe for the subcommittee the role the NFSTC plays in assuring the work of the nation's crime laboratory has a solid foundation of good science. I believe that now and in the future, the scientific analysis of physical evidence will aid more investigation and enhance the criminal justice process. However, good science is not cheap. It's imperative that funding is available to make sure that forensic laboratories are accredited and staffed with well-trained, competent, and professional analysts. The NFSTC has a history of assisting the community in the aforementioned areas. Laws like PL 106-561, the Paul Coverdale National Forensic Science Improvement Act, and PL 106-546, the DNA Backlog and Elimination Act of 2000, can assist this. It is vital that funding authorized by these laws be fully appropriated so that state and local laboratories receive the funding they need to provide timely, fault-free, and necessary services to the public safety of their citizens. The NFSTC wants to be a resource to this sub subcommittee on matters concerning forensic science, and I'd be pleased to answer any questions you may have. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, we're now going to go to general questions of uh, all of you as a group or individually, and it's going to be five minutes per round. I'll start with Ms. Maloney, five minutes, and I'll take five minutes, and she'll take five minutes. Okay, the gentlewoman from New York. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I'd like to ask uh, David Boyd. Um, has, has NIJ done any research as to standardizing evidence collection kits? 
And do you believe that the laboratories would be more effective and efficient if they were all working off of the same evidence collection standards? NIJ has, over the last uh, two years, uh, published a series of guides, uh, beginning at the direction of the Attorney General with a guide on the collection uh, of evidence at homicide scenes. And we now have produced additional guides for crime scenes in general for the handling of eyewitnesses, explosive and arson investigations. And these guides represent a consensus of what needs to be done at the crime scene in collecting and preserving forensic evidence. Uh, each of the states inevitably adjusts these in keeping with the laws as they obtain in their, in their own jurisdictions, and they have to do that. Uh, but I think it's imperative that the community uh, begin to think very, very extensively, I think, uh, about how to develop a series of appropriate guides that establish what the minimum standards are for the collection, preservation, and analysis of forensic evidence. Uh, Keith, uh, Conrad, do you agree? Uh, would you like to elaborate? Would, it, would the process be easier if there were, were standardized evidence uh, recovery practices? Well, I can, speak quicker? For, I can speak for New York State because we did standardize the kit. Uh, for a while we had two kits uh, and we've standardized that to actually one kit now and that has been beneficial to the laboratories in New York State having one type of kit where we know exactly what items are to be collected, how they're to be collected, what the instructions are within that kit for the collecting agency. So from the perspective of one state's view, absolutely it's been very beneficial. And, and you mentioned the backlogs that, that you talked about. Are, are they throughout all areas or are they just specifically just DNA testing? Backlogs are being exhibited throughout all areas and as I made as a reference, uh, DNA affects many areas and for instance one of them I use as example with trace evidence where we would get in now we're getting in vacuum cleaner bags our trace evidence section must go through those vacuum cleaner bags because of what is considered to be potential DNA evidence now is much different than it was five years ago so we must identify hairs uh, full hairs with roots partial hairs and determine are they suitable for DNA analysis and if so uh, make some decisions as to whether we can possibly even consider analyzing all of this potential evidence that exists. So DNA affects many sections of the laboratory and hence there are many backlogs of all sections. Um, Mrs. Smith had mentioned the SANE nursing. Uh, there's a lot of other issues when we're talking about sexual assaults or rapes, uh, dealing with these rape kits and that also includes drug facilitated rape or sexual assault. There's a lot of other issues that are being generated as a result of DNA and sexual assault, et cetera. And these impact all of our laboratories. New York State does not have the resources uh, to do DFR, drug facilitated rape uh, testing. So there's backlogs across the broad spectrum. Well, many of you talked about uh, backlogs and, and uh, Mr. Sheck in his testimony talked about how he worked with the police commissioner in New York City to attack the the, the backlog and uh, they outsourced it and they still couldn't attack the backlog because even with the private resources and the public resources, they were not able, able to address it. And he mentioned earlier that you should uh, really attack the evidence between seven or 10 days to have the best uh, effect. So we really have this wonderful tool, uh, but we're not efficiently really using it across uh, the nation. And I'd like to hear if there any ideas of how how we can address this? Um, anyone's comment? I'd we... like to uh, mm -hmm. respond to that, if I might. Um, to give you one idea of what might be done, uh, research and development has shown over the years that we've been able to reduce the time it takes to perform DNA testing. When we began performing DNA testing in the late 1980s, it would take six to eight weeks to perform one test. Now that has been reduced to days. Uh, so therefore, the research and development monies that have been uh, allocated to DNA efforts has greatly reduced the amount of time it now takes. And as Dr. Boyd mentioned uh, in his statement, additional research in the area of, of chip technology is also looking to reduce the amount of time it takes. But I might point out 
that that is the amount of time it takes to do the DNA process alone. That does not count towards the time it takes to identify a stain or an item suitable for DNA testing. When you're talking about hundreds of items of evidence submitted in one particular case, it may take days or weeks to find that one particular stain that then can go through DNA testing. Given the fact that it takes such a long time, and again going back to Mr. Sheck's uh, testimony, uh, where he suggested that possibly we should have a standard, a state or a federal standard, that certain crimes you do first. Obviously, if you're in prison, don't do the DNA check. Uh, but many states are doing DNA checks of prisoners first. Should we not have a federal standard that those on parole uh, be it attacked first uh, for, for the backlog? I just wanted your comments or any I, uh, comments on it. I have known Mr. Sheck now for well over a decade, and I can tell you that he and I have not always seen eye to eye on things, but today he and I see eye to eye on almost everything, and his priority list is exactly right. The priorities of reducing the backlogs, but not forgetting the cases that are happening today mm -hmm. and being able to attack those cases right now. Mm -hmm. His priority of, of seeing mitochondrial DNA testing uh, placed in the crime laboratories at the state and local level. Those are proper priorities that uh, should be addressed. Um, Dr. Boyd and Mr. Adams, uh, I'd like to know how much money is the federal government providing to the states and local forensic laboratories? Uh, the National Institute of Justice uh, will have this year uh, a total of uh, $60 million, which is, or I'm sorry, $30 million, which is available directly to uh, state and local forensic laboratories, and that's for DNA and general forensic uh, work as well. Uh, some of that is earmarked, but it all goes to uh, states for forensic applications. In addition to that, uh, we have just received uh, authority to reprogram $25 million of asset forfeiture money to help with the CODIS backlog, that also will go to the states, uh, which represents by itself about 50, so that gives you a total of about $55 million this year, which will go to state and local laboratories, and that is far and away the largest amount ever provided in a year uh, to state and local crime laboratories. Any comments on that, on the money? Is it too much, little, or what? Uh, it's always not I think enough, it, right? <clears throat> I think it's not nearly, I'll speak for these gentlemen, I'm sure they won't disagree with this, it's not nearly enough, but I think that the, the issue is somehow directing the priorities so that you get the most return for the investment. And one of the things that I'm sure uh, Mr. Asplund and uh, Dr. Boyd could testify to is that when uh, uh, some of the backlog money, the $14.4 million, was uh, being sent out, I know that NIJ was encouraging state and local labs to do more of the unsolved cases. I think, what was it, Chris? The initial request was that they do 2% of the appropriations go towards unsolved cases. And when we're talking about the unsolved cases, we're talking about those rape kits, like Debbie Smith's rape kit. And I can't think of a more important, and, and, they, and they argued with NIJ and they said, well, look, you know, given all our priorities, given the pressures that the states are putting on us to show some result for convicted offender backlog, we can't do 2%. We have to have it at just 1%. So, you know, there, there has to be a way of redirecting the priorities. It is very true what they're saying about with more trace evidence now is going into the laboratories. We need training on how people can identify which are the appropriate stains so they can be more efficient. But I again have to come back to this point. What can be more efficient well, than typing get... those rape kits? Because we know that those sexual assault cases are gonna give the identity of the semen donor and there is no more powerful application of DNA than those untested rape kits. Well, let me ask Dr. Boyd, uh, do we have a training kit uh, for laboratories that has been worked out by the uh, 
a National Institute of Justice so that you'd have some uh, uniformity across the country, because science is science, and how do you best deal with it? I think everybody there has given me impression of priorities, and uh, I think it's probably a pretty common uh, separate now. Uh, if there are priorities that you heard that you don't like, and there's others that you want to put in, let me know right now, because <laughs> we'd like to okay, Mr. Asplund. On, on the training program, there, there are a couple of, a couple of issues with training. Uh, the FBI offers, uh, I think, probably the best DNA training available in the United States, but they're also constrained uh, when it comes to resources. It costs uh, some amount of money to train these personnel. It costs some amount of money to get those personnel to a place where they can be trained, even when they go out to the field to provide the training. You're talking about laboratories that are, that are overwhelmed that have to free up people to go to the training. We have, if I can steal from Chris here, we have developed a a uh, series of, uh, of compact discs, uh, CDs, uh, on DNA evidence. This is actually aimed at every police officer so that it ideally provides reasonable training for the first person who's on the scene so that that person knows how to protect the evidence and with any amount of luck doesn't destroy the evidence before it can get to the crime laboratory and be analyzed. This CD, uh, interestingly enough, has now been uh, requested uh, by the British as well who like it uh, and are interested in using it. One point I think it's important to make, uh, we've had a number of people who've talked about DNA evidence and other sources of evidence. It's important to remember that DNA only represents about or less than 3% of all the material that comes into crime laboratories for analysis. And it's an important 3% because it ha it's so powerful and it has so great a payoff that, that its pay is out of proportion, its payoff is out of proportion to the amount of the evidence, but it's still important to remember that the crime lab has to face that whole range of evidence, and so it, it manages to keep them pretty overwhelmed. The last point I'd make is the priority issue is a little bit of a chicken and the egg kind of problem. Uh, so far, there have been 150 cold hits just by requiring the 1%, because so many states told us they simply couldn't do more than 1%. Nevertheless, it's also true that if we don't populate the database itself, then we can't get hits when we do no suspect data. And if we populate that and don't do the no suspect uh, analysis, then we're not going to get the hits we want. Uh, ultimately, I think uh, there needs to be some effort to look at funding both ends of this equation because it's very much a sine qua non. The one is required to make the other one really pay off. Uh, my time is up. Uh, Ms. Maloney has five minutes now for questioning. Because of the huge backlog, uh, some of you testified that the statute of limitations runs out and some states are responding by eliminating the statute of limitations or other, uh, other adjustments. And uh, again, uh, Mr. Sheck in his testimony mentioned a proposed New York state law that would allow um, John Doe warrants to keep that case alive thereby not doing away with the statute of limitations, uh, which has some benefit in certain cases. And I'd like to uh, ask Mr. Sheck to, to um, elaborate if you'd like, but I'd like each of you to state whether or not you think that's a good idea. Yeah, I, there are a number of different states that have proposals. The reason I think that my colleagues here might like the one in New York is that it, it, it says... It, by the way, has not passed. It's, it's not passed. It's proposed is that it, it, it makes the legislators, the state legislators, put money into the crime labs to deal with the backlog. It's not going to do any good for anyone, frankly, to say, let's not have any more statute of limitations on rape cases. Frankly, I can think of a class of cases where the uh, individual charged is it's a consent defense. DNA is going to be irrelevant, and you prosecute somebody, you know, 15 years later, uh, or some number of years later. It's not fair to anybody. But unless, you, unless the states pass this John Doe warrant uh, uh, type statute with additional monies to the crime labs so that they can actually do the testing on these unsolved rape cases, um, it's, not gonna, it's not gonna be effective. And so that's what's good about the silver bill is that it says we'll extend the statute of limitations by a year or two so as the statute is beginning to run out on uh, these cases, 
the crime labs have a tremendous incentive to go through all their unsolved rape kits just before the statute's going to expire and type all of them. I'd like uh, members of the panel to comment whether you support it or oppose it and why I, this proposal. I, I would agree um, with Mr. Sheck that as a vehicle to bring attention, number one, to the issue of rape kits that are being thrown out in cases that we're literally losing every day by the thousands, um, it's an excellent vehicle for that, especially if it brings money along. I'm not sure that it's necessarily a legal requirement in terms of actually filing the John Doe warrant. The first John Doe warrant on a DNA basis was filed in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, and we've had a number of them since then in states that don't have a statutory permission to do that. The John Doe warrant is not a new concept in criminal justice. We've been doing it for years based on AKA. We've been doing it based on physical description. It's just an infinitely better way of doing it. Um, so again, it may not be a legal requirement, but, but I would certainly agree that as a mechanism to bring home the extent of the problem uh, that we face uh, by these cases that are, that are being lost every day, I would agree with it. Any other comments? If, if I could just add, uh, just repeat what I said earlier, which was that in Connecticut, it wasn't a proposal, it actually has become law last year. Uh, it was a retroactive extension backwards of the statute of limitations 20 years. The only requirement was that the report had to be made to the police within five years of the occurrence. But pr assuming that happened, uh, then we could indict someone today uh, based on an incident which occurred 18, 19 years ago. Uh, and the reason we did this was because of the advent of DNA evidence, where it would be possible to identify the person involved. And, uh, it was discussed this question of consent. You know, consent can always be a defense, uh, obviously, in, in most sexual assaults, and, and that is a, a continuing problem. But nonetheless, uh, we did it, and, uh, and it, stood up, it stood up so far. On uh, cost that the chairman brought up, I'd like to go to, to uh, Dr. Downs. In your statement, uh, I believe you said that, that, that there was an average of $195 per case and specifically DNA approximately $140 per sample, approximately $25 per CODIS database sample. Then I believe you stated that $135,000 for each cold CODIS. And can you explain the tremendous jump in price uh, from $25 to uh, $140 to $135,000? Uh, no. What is entailed in that amount? Yes, ma'am, be happy to. The $140 per DNA uh, evidence sample in a homicide case, a typical homicide case, we might have at least 10 evidence samples in that case. So right away, you jump to more like $1,500. Uh, the numbers that were broken down were by the total number of cold hits that we had in Alabama, which are 10. So we've taken all the funds that are targeted to the DNA operation to break it down to show you the cost per cold hit. As more cold hits come... Well, 135000 versus $25? That that's is per, huge. That's per sample that's entered into the database. That's a very uh, cost-effective thing to just put the clean samples into the database and store those samples uh, in the computer database for later comparison purposes. Mm -hmm. Okay, my time is up. I thank the gentlewoman, and uh, let me... Uh, note that Dr. Jamie Downs, the uh, Director Chief Medical Examiner of uh, the State of Alabama, I, uh, I'm interested in your proposal that uh, there ought to be creation of a National Commission on the Future of Forensic Laboratories, uh, which should be established, and that those uh, uh, said commissions should allow representatives of local, state, and federal crime laboratories and medical examiner communities to come together with various nationally recognized independent scientific authorities and the judiciary, the district uh, attorneys, the defense bar, the investigating agencies. Uh, I know uh, Dr. Downs is for it. Anybody else? Any concerns one way or the other to get them all in the room? Would that be a worthy endeavor? Yeah. Dr. Boyd. Uh, <clears throat> there are, I think with a properly drawn charter, that there are significant advantages in bringing together 
uh, the broad community to address any of these issues uh, that are of concern to the field. We've had a great deal of success, uh, I think, with the National DNA Commission in looking very broadly at DNA issues separate from all of the institutional imperatives. And so I think there's a great deal to be said for a similar kind of approach. Now, as I remember, uh, the, often the Attorney General of the United States brings that type of a conference together. Sometimes it's the president on a White House this or that, like White House Conference on Youth. Uh, I've been on that one, and the White House this and that. Uh, do you think uh, the Attorney General uh, might have an interest in doing that, because it is a focused on a particular area that is tr strictly justice? I would have to refer that to the department. Yeah. Well, we, we might uh, make it a recommendation in our report to the House. Mr. Mr. Chairman, from, from the perspective of the National Commission on the Future of DNA Evidence, and I think the potential for that kind of deliberative body, it's important for a number of reasons. In many respects, the importance of a commission like that is as much the process as anything in that one of, I guess, the overriding philosophies behind the, the, this commission, the, the DNA commission, was how do you maximize the value of DNA evidence, its investigative value, while at the si same time engendering public trust in the system. The fact that we were able to, on a national level, in a very open forum, discuss important issues like privacy, like funding, um, and, and even some of the scientific issues, I think were very important and ultimately enabled us to advance things even more quickly and enabled us to integrate the technology more quickly. Um, our ability, for example, when arrestee testing first came up, it was a very touchy subject. But at that time, the discussion was being held on CNN uh, or, or on Larry King Live one night with Commissioner Safer, the next night with the ACLU. When the Attorney General came to the Commission and said, I'd like you folks to discuss this, the playing field was leveled, and the public had an opportunity to hear what was going on and, and to participate in it. And I think the nature of the process itself is incredibly important. Uh, I think the tangible benefits, the more tangible benefits, though, I think are, are important also. We wouldn't really be talking that much about backlog reduction through outsourcing if the Commission hadn't started to make that recommendation three years ago. The community had talked about it, the forensic community had talked about it, but we hadn't set it forth as a proposition, and, and I think that was one of the great um, accomplishments of the commission. Uh, now, there is a commission uh, right now with some members on it, isn't it? The, the National Commission on the Future of DNA Evidence uh, is still in existence. However, its charter expires in August. We have existed for four years now, and that charter will expire. Now, does the Attorney General appoint those individuals to that commission? No, they were not appointed by the Attorney General. That was, it was a commission created by the Attorney General. It was administered through the National Institute of Justice. The appointees were made through the director of NIJ. At that time, it was Director Travis. Uh, I have an interest in this because uh, 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 Norval Morris, I think a lot of you know, a very distinguished lawyer in uh, University of uh, Chicago Law School. Uh, also, Robert Kutak, he's no longer alive, but he was one of the founders, and I uh, just tagged along with him. And uh, we created the National Institute of Corrections at the request of uh, Chief Justice Berger, called us in and said, for heaven's sake, try to get the states to uh, get up to the standards that we have in the Federal Bureau of Prisons. And uh, we did that. And we went through 11 attorney generals doing that. But uh, it worked, and we put out money. It didn't take much. All you had to do was get a lot of them at, to get a cup of coffee and sit up there at Lake Tahoe and have great thoughts. And then we did that to bring all the parties and stakeholders. And things did change. Uh, a new generation jail was uh, accepted by the state of Florida and Miami-Dade. And uh, all of that uh, was uh, uh, didn't take uh, very much money, but uh, we changed their approach to it. Mm -hmm. In fact, they uh, issued a day uh, uh, to uh, honor our uh, individual in charge of jails and prisons, Mr. Nelson. So uh, I think this type of bringing people together will help, and obviously the money helps too in the specific way of accreditation and you I take it you wouldn't be giving the money if they hadn't been accredited in their 
laboratory. Is that correct? Uh, that's correct. They have to demonstrate um, a number of, they have to meet a number of qualification requirements uh, and they have to be properly eligible for accreditation. That uh, makes sense. Does the uh, gentlewoman from New York have any other? I uh, would just like to ask uh, Mr. Sheck. Earlier I asked uh, Mr. Boyd and Mr. Coonrod, and they, they said that they supported having a, a national standardized test for, for evidence. Um, and I'd like to hear your comments on it. Would you have one just for all evidence or just for rape victims? Uh, and I'd like to hear any other members of the panel if, uh, comment whether they think it would help you in solving crimes, make it more efficient, save money, and help us uh, find criminals faster. I think the rape kits may be uh, the, a good and, and, and simple and easy way to start. And I think, as Dr. Boyd pointed out, uh, NIJ has put out um, uh, guides to law enforcement in a whole series of areas. Um, the, 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 the idea of, for example, standards on collecting and packaging evidence, uh, I think, are pretty important, uh, particularly since these technologies are so sensitive and uh, it is so easy to confound investigators by uh, getting extraneous DNA samples on pieces of evidence, everybody here knows that, uh, that can uh, uh, create real problems in the case. So uh, I think that there's room for establishing national standards. I think that uh, but each jurisdiction is going to be a little different, and uh, they, they will probably be developing their own uh, variations. As long as it's within a certain national standard on some of these things, I think it could be helpful. Would anyone else like to comment? Yeah, I might volunteer that uh, in, in the state of Indiana, a program that's been real successful is uh, uh, we have a state statute that uh, assists victims of crime and, and uh, sexual assault victims particularly uh, by paying for the medical expenses for the examinations performed. Uh, in order to, for the hospital to apply directly for those funds, uh, a standardized sexual assault evidence kit must be used that's approved uh, by a committee of the state, including forensic scientists from uh, our state crime laboratories. So it's been a real successful program, I think, and that's just one idea I might share with you. In regards to the overall concept of evidence collection, uh, the accreditation program uh, recently uh, in, in the year 2001, added the new discipline of crime scene processing, which is a, an additional discipline that accredited laboratories may participate in. And I think that this is going to be, to go a long way towards uh, causing the agencies to create, uh, with guides, uh, such as already been mentioned, uh, internal systems of managing how crime scenes are processed. Uh, there's a history in law enforcement and in field investigations that if we write down no rules, it's a little more difficult to uh, evaluate our weaknesses. Uh, it's going to take time. It's going to take uh, years. But this is a good start uh, in the development of uh, more high-quality, consistent uh, processing of crime scenes. Thank you. Any um, I, I think that there's an important difference between standardization per se, for example, of a rape kit and minimum standards, um, particularly when you're dealing with jurisdictional specifics. Uh, for example, some rape kits um, are equipped with the ability to take uh, uh, blood alcohol content, take blood for blood alcohol. Um, some jurisdictions don't do that. Some don't want to do that. Uh, but however, some consider it important uh, at that stage. So I think it's important to, to understand and to keep in mind um, the distinction between minimum standards uh, around which individual jurisdictions can accommodate their own requirements as opposed to standardization such as one rape kit which would apply to all different jurisdictions. If I could just add something very briefly on that. Uh, I would agree some type of minimal standard is important but flexibility is crucial because jurisdictions can be very different. Uh, but we did uh, adopt a, a statewide standard in our state, in Connecticut, and we actually included as part of the hospital regulatory process that they were required to have a standard operating procedure. The medical professionals required to have specialized training 
in collection of this evidence, not just the scientific side, but the human side of dealing with victims in that situation. And finally, the, the most surprising thing of all was we found out that some hospitals in our state actually build the victims for the cost of the collection of the evidence as if it were a medical procedure, and we've now outlawed that. But I think in discussing these procedures, you will uncover the horror stories that are out there, that uh, there's, there's extraordinary insensitivities that take place every day with regard to victims of crime, and only beginning this discussion uh, helps resolve those problems. I want to thank all of you for your really thoughtful and excellent testimony today. Thank you. Let me just ask a few questions and then we'll wrap it up. Uh, what are the privacy policies of uh, these labs and what, well, let's get the answer to that. Are there any problems uh, in terms of privacy or something, uh, Mr. Well, Mr. Adams? Mr. Chairman, uh, first of all, the DNA Act of 1994, which established the uh, CODIS and the National DNA Index System, had built into it um, a certain requirements which uh, allows for the evidence, for the samples to be inputted into the national system, but done so with very limited information. Uh, a unique identifier for the sample, an identifier for the laboratory that performed the analysis, uh, and the identity of the laboratory analyst that, that did the testing. Very limited information. Secondly, it's limited as far as access. Only accessible by uh, those laboratories approved to perform DNA and, and enter them into CODIS. And then thirdly, limited as far as accessibility with regard to buildings. They are in secure locations. Um, so we have um, attempted to adhere to uh, the need for maintaining strict um, uh, compliance with privacy issues. Uh, that's at the federal level. And of course, as, as you're probably familiar, uh, many states have enacted uh, confidentiality uh, legislation. I think 46 of the 50 states. Uh, over half of the states have um, um, criminal penalties associated with uh, improper disclosure. So privacy has been a, an important issue that was also discussed by the Commission on DNA as well as the DNA Advisory Board. Uh, does some of that also include the so-called disgruntled employee where they damage some of the samples? Have you ever had that in any of the lab laboratories? And is it part of the accreditation system? I'm unfamiliar with that, uh, um, okay. that aspect. Well, Mr. Conley, you probably... Well, <clears throat> in, in terms of... Uh, the possibility of a, of a disgruntled employee doing something that would be damaging to uh, a database, uh, certainly uh, I believe in an accredited laboratory situation uh, that would not go undiscovered and it would not go unaddressed. Uh, one of the worst cases, I, the, the data in the form that it's recovered uh, or that is stored in a database really doesn't mean anything to anybody who's concerned about the likelihood for somebody to die early or of a disease or to pass on a genetic defect or something like that. And this in and of itself helps to build in uh, some security. Uh, in terms of some damage to the database, typically those of us who have the responsibility for maintaining state databases do maintain under high security uh, samples to have the ability to reconstruct it if necessary in the future. Uh, I hope that responsive to your question. Does uh, a, D a DNA sample that, uh, say, prove to a person could be exonerated, what happens to the sample? Uh, does that then just... Uh, it's frequent uh, that we've had hits, uh, certainly in our state, uh, where people have been identified uh, after the laboratory test has excluded a suspect. Uh, those suspects would not meet the definition of our uh, state law, which is basically fits the, the federal regulations and, and the, uh, the federal law. Uh, the, the, the profile of an innocent person or a person who was excluded could not be put into the database. Uh, only 
for instance, samples, uh, question, unknown samples that have, uh, uh, in cases that have not been solved, uh, there have been some case-to-case -case hits, obviously, uh, between specimens recovered in, in separate criminal invest investigations, separate criminal assaults. We re recently had uh, some in Indiana that were on opposite sides of the state. Uh, then a suspect was developed in one of the cases and uh, successfully uh, charged, uh, at least to this point, in both counties. But the, 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 the issue here is not the CODIS system, all right? I mean, you have the national computer and you have the state and local computers, and there are very strict requirements, as uh, Dwight Adams said, for putting those samples in. We put those into the 1994 Act. That's not the problem. If everybody would live, if all the state and local authorities would live with precisely the CODIS rules, that would be fine, but they're not. What's happening now, that state and local authorities have the capacity to do their own DNA typing, it's a pretty simple matter to extract the DNA profile, let's say, because we know, know it, we found out in our commission, or our National DNA Commission, that this has apparently happened. They take a sample from a rape victim, or from, let's say, a husband whose sample was taken for elimination purposes. Or, what is very frequently happening, I believe, they'll go, uh, 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 police will say to some individual, look, we want your sample for elimination purposes because you live in this area or uh, the, you're near a crime scene, all right? And we just want it for this case, or they indicate it, they suggest it's just for this case. Then those samples, they can't be put into CODIS but they can be put into that state and local data bank. And those, unfortunately, are not regulated. They're not subject to the CODIS rules. And I think that uh, to the extent that uh, states are not dealing with this issue and that lab directors are kind of in a, you know, the problem they have, I'll give you a very specific example. We have a client in New York. He was exonerated. The man I talked to before, talked to you about before, who, uh, you know, with bite mark evidence, they took the saliva stain and then the fingernail scrapes and matched them up. He's exonerated. He leaves jail. Under our CODIS and state rules, his sample will come back to him. But the New York City Medical Examiner's Office has that DNA profile. And they say, well, I have no authorization to get rid of it. We're just going to keep it in our computer. Now, that is the reaction, unfortunately, I think, in all too many places because they feel, well, if there's uh, uh, I, I think there. I think it's a, it's a terrible mistake because the the laboratories on this privacy question should be as clean as Caesar's wife. <laughs> uh, otherwise, uh, there's going to be an error. There's going to be some kind of privacy problem, and a lot of people who are very concerned and sensitive about this issue are going to come back to these very gentlemen who are here asking for money, and I support putting money, as I've indicated, you know, into this, and they're not going to get it uh, because there's going to be this problem. And so, uh, uh, really, more attention has to be paid to these privacy issues. And incidentally, it's no longer good enough to say that, well, all these STR markers, or all these DNA markers, they're all, quote, unquote, junk DNA. Well, we sequence the genome, right? We realize that this junk DNA is very meaningful. One of these markers, incidentally, uh, THO1, uh, uh, is uh, actually... Uh, 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 implicated in, I think, a disease. I may, I may be wrong about which one, but I think it's a marker for some form of diabetes. So, we just I'm wrong about which one, but I think it's a marker for some form of diabetes. So, we just can't say that anymore. <coughs> Any comments anybody else wants to make on the record? Yes, I, Mr. I, I would. I would agree wholeheartedly that there are still a lot of discussions that need to be had over the issue of state and local databases and who needs to go in. And one example that I would give was the dragnet scenario, for example, in Ann Arbor, Michigan, where an individual investigation was conducted and uh, blood samples were taken from over 150 African Americans. They gave their samples um, voluntarily. When the case was ultimately solved, and uh, the, the, the real perpetrator was identified. When those individuals went back and asked for their sample back, that was refused. It was refused because law enforcement took the position that they had lawfully obtained it, and they had. 
It was true. They had lawfully obtained it. However, I would venture to say that the next time that the Ann Arbor Police Department decides to try to enlist the help, the voluntary help of its citizens, it may find itself in a difficult position. I go back to the importance of privacy from the standpoint of if we are going to maximize the investigative value of this technology, we must do so in a way that engenders the public trust along the way. Well, thank you. Uh, any of you that want to make statements, uh, we will be glad to include them in this part of the hearing. Uh, and if you think of something in the airplane or in the automobile, gee, I wish I'd had that idea, just send it in to uh, us and we'll uh, deal with it. So I want to thank each of you. It's been a long morning and uh, you've all had some excellent ideas. and. Uh, Hopefully, I think we'll have that national conference that the Attorney General ought to do and uh, get you all in the room again. So uh, if that will be some good. So I'm going to now thank us uh, for the staff uh, and help. Uh, Mrs. Maloney had a number of staff members, I believe. Uh, you have the minority staff, of course, Michelle Ash, uh, professional staff, Jean Gosa, minority clerk. Did you have anybody else that helped? On this? Okay. Okay. Put them into the uh, microphone. We'll. This, this is such. She's going to have to spell it. <laughs> spell your name. I can make it. It's more G R C A D Z I N S K I. And Jenna Dennis. Well, thank you all. And then uh, for our, the majority staff, J. Russell George, uh, Staff Director, Chief Counsel for the Subcommittee, uh, Bonnie Heald, who was to my immediate uh, left, and uh, the professional staff member that put this together, and is also Director of Communications. Uh, assistant to the committee, Scott Fagan. Uh, staff Assistant, Chris Barkley. Uh, interns, Alex Horowitz, uh, Ryan Sullivan and uh, Faraya uh, Falik uh, in terms, and not the end of it all, but she's here always from beginning to end, and that's the court reporter, uh, Jerry Lida. And we thank you, Jerry, again. This was a long day for you. So with that, we're adjourned. Here's a look at some hearings available through our websites. You can listen live to Senate committee hearings, check hearing schedules, and link to the official committee websites at C-SPAN's capitalhearings.org. Tomorrow at 10 a.m. Eastern, 